Welcome back to the State of the Arc podcast. My name is Mike. My name is Kason. This is episode eight of our Xenogears story analysis. This time we played from right after the fight against Ellie in the Gears, all the way up to D District, well, it's D Block, I guess. D Block, yeah. Uh, in Nortune, which is the capital city of Kislev, there's a D Block prison in that city. Um, up to the point and where kind you're of through a, that, yeah. Yeah, you're about to enter into the tournament the, to fight in the gears in the battling arena. Right before starting yeah. the battling arena, we stopped right there. Um, and I'm just going to do this now, uh, rather than waiting to the end. Next time, <laughs> play up all the way up to the point where Rico tries to break into or fails at breaking into the central district and is arrested. There's a couple of cutscenes that happen right after that where you're talking to Saitan and Hammer. Get through those, but the first chance you get to save after Rico's arrest and after the following cutscenes, stop there. Hopefully that's clear enough. It's very clear mm. to me. Should be easy. Okay, I've never to, played to it before, figure so I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. All right. So, we left off leaving from Nissan. Obviously, they had the, the, the coup plan where they're going to try to get Bart set up on the throne, where they're going to try to draw Gebler forces out of the capital city. Uh, phase yeah. part of that was to attack the major force uh, into on the northern border between Kislev and Ave to keep them distracted, while the secondary force moves on the western force, um, which is a smaller one, which mm. would draw Gebler forces from the capital, and then Bart and Saitan and uh, Sigurd are going to go in there kill Shakan, take the throne back. That was the plan. Yeah. Um, so the way, I hate when I start off with a criticism. <laughs> oh no. I don't like to start off with something, you know, like that. Well, like. But I think the sequence as a whole is a really great sequence. It's a really exciting sequence. It ends. The battle and everything. Yeah. yeah. It ends on this really high note in terms of just its excitement and just the imagery, the coolness factor, I guess. Yes. It yes, overall yes. is a fantastic sequence. I really like the way that it plays out. The one thing that I was talking about with uh, some of the patrons that I don't love about the way that this scene is structured is that they start you off with Faye, right? Doing his part of the plan. Yeah, yeah. And and they're kind of wondering, man, I wonder if Bart's okay. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is that it, in the middle of this scene, it cuts to Bart, and we already know how miserably he failed. Yes. So when we come back to Faye again, it's like, oh, the stakes aren't quite as high because oh. you already know it's useless. What you're fighting for has already yeah. failed. Well, that's a good point. That's a good point. Yeah. So I would have rather that you play all the way through Faye's part. All the way up to the Vandercom boss fight, you and finish that whole Bart. section, even with Graf coming in and all that. Then you go to Bart, yeah. pulling up and showing up, and by that time we've already had what happens with uh, the red gear showing up. I'll just put it that way for now. <laughs> um, yes, yeah. And they're wondering what's going on here. Where's Faye? Kind of a thing, right? Right. I think if it had been split that way, um, it would have been a little better, but. Let's dig into it piece by piece here. Um, so, yeah. I really love this section because we left off where he goes back into the cave after fighting Ellie and he kind of hops up. Yeah, all the way And to then the top. Uh, they're kind of looking out and they see the fleet, right? The Gebler fleet out there. And um, I forget his name. It's, it's the guy who's like second in command or the commander. Mm -hmm. uh, my, mm, my something or other. Yes. My tro Treya or it's, I can't remember exactly his name. Something like we'll put that. it on the screen. Yeah, I can't Anyways, <laughs> he's like, what are we going to do? You know, how are we going to handle this? And, and Bart or uh, Faye's just kind of like, you just do this. And he just jumps down and like just starts charging in, right? And yeah. Like, All right, here we go. That person's like, oh man, I, I love, he said something I kind of unexpected, but it was just like, man, I, I admire his, um, like tenacity to just like jump in, right? Here, right. Yeah. Or he he says something like uh, he's got he's even more gung ho than that's it than, than Bart than Bart is. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. He's even more gung ho. <laughs> that's so funny. So, but I really like this little mini game, I guess, if you want to put it that way, where you're kind of avoiding gears 
as you're like going up the screen mm -hmm. uh, and like getting past like the first level of the fleet and then you get to the second level of the fleet and they're kind of hovering around. You're I kinda, love like, it when they them. when they implement like different kind of gameplay yeah. than the usual, than just what you're always doing within, right. within games. They do that a lot here, I like it. Square was really good at that at the time, mixing things up. So yeah. it's, you're not just doing the same thing over so, and over and over. Well, that's over one of the things I liked about Nier as well. Yeah. It, it changed the gameplay quite a bit. Broke it up from yeah. section to section, made it interesting, put some kind of fresh take on its spin. Something different. Yeah, that's and always cool. I really liked this. Um, again, another thing that was really charming about these RPGs from this time is they were filled with abstractions. And so, like, this as another abstraction for the idea of breaking through an enemy yes, fleet, exactly. right? Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know, there's just something... Something really charming about how they would come up with all of these sort of like artistically creative ways mm -hmm. of getting across the idea of something yes. when they did not have the means to show to you actually really doing do the thing. that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, so this was just a really clever way of doing that. You know, you can either avoid the battles or sometimes you know you hit them. You have to fight some guys on the yeah. way through, but you break through. You get to the flagship. And uh, this is where Vandercom is uh, in command, <laughs> right? That seems so funny. <laughs> with his, with his um, it, what, what did he call it? It was oh, the admiral or something. There, there was another. Yeah, he's like, it's probably the name. Well, a aviation, aviation. It's just aviation officer. I was gonna say aviation officer, but that sounded wrong because they're in like sand ships. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was like, that's why right. is he called it? Anyways, yeah, aviation, right. aviation officer. I was going to say that. I was on the tip of my tongue, but I was like, I feel like that's wrong. Because they're, they're, they're not, anyways. <laughs> Maybe it's because gears fly, I don't know. But yeah, Vandercom is, is getting into an argument, not necessarily an argument, but um, he's being defied a little bit by the aviation officer. Yeah. Well, it seems like the aviation officer was was giving orders initially, saying, hey, do this, do this, do this, do this. And like, okay, ready, break. And then Vandercom yeah. comes in, he's like, hold it. Don't do any of that. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do any of what he just said. And they're like, are you sure? And he's like, yes, we're gonna lure them in close and we're gonna use our big cannon and we're gonna take them all out in one shot. <laughs> and the admiral's like, or the aviation officer's like, are, are you sure? Because <laughs> gears are really maneuverable, and this yes. gun, like, we can't track very quickly, yes, you know? Fast. And he's like, yes, I'm sure. I, I don't see how Vandercom can be this um, this dense. Like, it's yeah. pretty bad, because this is Stupid. not his first failure yeah. it, with regards to this. But yeah. he really wants to use the big gun that he has, which is exactly what it was predicted he would do um, in this situation. Yeah. It's like, because, yeah, it's like you're saying here. He says, uh, "Com officer, change of orders." Yeah, change of orders. Yeah, he <laughs> Contact totally. Contact von Hipper. Have the second destroyer squadron approach the enemy flank. Open the fleet side and bait them into entering the main guns firing arc. Right. Yeah. So That's, he's he's um, trying to he's bait like, them into let where them he get can close shoot. to me. Yeah. And then the aviation officer says outright, "Huh? It's stupid." But but but, <laughs> but in um really? Yeah, he says it's stupid. There's no way the flagship well, gun can hit speeding gear. What I was seeing, there was a lot of um, parentheses. I think he may yeah, have that might have deleted that might the true. parentheses. That here. might be true. The game facts guy yeah, might have gotten rid because he's thinking this to himself. Exactly, right? because I remember specifically he was being very polite, and uh, yeah, as Vandercom is being kind of done, the um, aviation officer is saying things to himself inwardly, yeah. uh, and they're using parentheses. They should have done that more often. That was kind of my critique here, because there's a lot of moments where I think uh, Faye or others are talking but, to themselves. Yeah, see, here he has it in parentheses. Your plan will never work, but up here he doesn't. And I don't know if that's because I'm pretty sure he, he didn't call Vandercom here. stupid. <laughs> I'm just pretty I'll look sure. At, I'll look at the, the, he may the, have. the footage again, but yeah, at least here he is correctly putting the parentheses, saying your plan will never work. He's doubting him the whole oh, time. Oh, the whole time. And it's like it's everyone really knows that Vandercom is not very special, <laughs> but but for whatever reason, Vandercom is considered the elite strategist fighter from the yeah. forces, uh, like the special people. Well, forces. he was in Rams's position before Rams's got there. Yeah, so over that's the whole like Gibbler fleet on what third in command from everything service. or something. Like that's crazy. Like yeah, that's a high, 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 high military position, and he's of the people who consider themselves much better than the lowly lambs, right? And he is about as like half wit of, of a person as you'll find. How I find this unlikely. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes in life, it's 
more like who you know than what you know kind of sure, a deal. It's sure. like if you can make the right friends in the right places, you get it. Then you that's more in politics, I feel, than it Yeah, well, they say you fail, you fall upwards. Yeah, <laughs> when but... When you screw up, people say, oh, but he did what we wanted him to do, so even though he failed... I do remember him. somebody, I think is one of our patrons, emailed me uh, and was talking about he, he's in the military and he's seen... Yeah people who should definitely not be elevated, finding themselves elevated. You know what, I have actually, I've heard from people in the military as well who yeah. who think that their generals are just absolute morons. Yeah. 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 So, well, but but once you get to the general admiral, like like high commander kind of you positions, would hope. you're basically playing <laughs> politics at yeah. that point anyways. Those yeah. are all politicians, you yeah. know. They're trying to get cabinet positions, they're trying to get board positions on uh, Lockheed Martin and stuff. So right. that makes sense. I guess, you know, when you frame it like that, that makes a little yeah. more sense. But down here, when it doesn't work, Vandercom <laughs> is like, this whole ship, all of you are morons. And yeah, the aviation, you guys officer, are stupid. aviation officer thinking to himself, you're the biggest moron. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Just can't well, also, the guy, guy who's trying to shoot these, these fast gears with this cannon that's just way slow, he, he fires the first shot and it misses. And that's where yeah. Vandercom's like, what? Why'd you miss? What's wrong with you? And the guy's like, dude, I'm doing my best. Yeah. So, so it doesn't work. work. Faye yeah. gets through. And uh, they, they, that's one, that's like the first boss fight there is you fight the guns themselves. You like, yeah, that was kind of fun. Destroy yeah. the guns. The two small ones and then the big cannon in the middle. And Vandercom starts kind of panicking at that point because that was his, that's his, he, all of he, he relies too on much on that gun. On yeah. that. So when that gun's gone, he starts to kind of lose it. Everyone's kind of running off the bridge and he starts to be like, I still have that. I still have that. He has one more thing up his sleeve, right? I still have that. I still have that. It's yeah. going to be okay. I still have that. It's Gollum right? style. It's the... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, she can do it for us. And it's like that whole kind of exchange there. You come back in after fighting Ellie into the cave. And you save right there, right? And there's the little uh, robot who sells you stuff. The gear. Right? Yes, yes. You the jump funny guy. up the, like the platforms and you come to an exit of the cave. And he's like, oh, I think from here we can get out. Yeah. And then from there, it cuts to Bart infiltrating. Oh, the whole time. Infiltrating the castle. Ah, so the whole time we know. The whole yes, time Faye's fighting. The whole fighting. time that, that you're fighting. Makes, you're right. You're you right. already know that Bart failed. You're right, yeah. yeah. So what happens is, is it cuts from there over to Bart's party. They're down like underneath in the waterway area. And they're like, talking, yeah. okay, we're just going to go off straight after Shikan. Let's just avoid killing any of the Ave soldiers if you can. Yeah. Just go straight there. We know where he's going to be. All right, go. And they like they break out and they come right out. And the second that they he's the second there. that they emerge, a door's open and Shikan and Miang come walking. Yeah, Miang. And they're right. like, yeah, uh, Ramses saw through this right away. Um, he saw through like all of it, not <laughs> just that they're going to try and kill Shikan, but also the the d decoy. What, the distraction, yeah. you know, military stuff. He saw through, like, all of the operations. Yeah. and That's kind of crazy. I though. like Miang's line here. She's talking to Saitan. She says, Hyuga, have you lived down here so long that your mind has slipped? Mm -hmm. So she's, like, taunting him. She knows who he is. Obviously, yes. he used to be an element. So, like, uh, that would be kind of like a yes. sting this at, is, at uh, Satan's pride as an intelligent. Has, um, has the love of the halfling's leaf slowed your mind? <laughs> That's what Miang is saying here, right? Because yes, <laughs> because Satan's kind of with the fo common folk, you know, and like, ooh, you're, it's it's That's causing fantastic. it's causing you problems. That's fantastic. There was a, I think it was Chocolate Rob on the last episode we uploaded. Yeah, uh, was well that we uploaded, but this is now two weeks removed. So this is actually three episodes weeks ago. ago yeah. <laughs> Anyways. He, he said that um, he saw a parallel between uh, Saitan's gear and Shadowfax, how Shadowfax can only be um, oh, could only yeah. be tamed by Gandalf. By, yes, but yeah, it's yeah. like it's so like that gear could only be tamed or operated by hey. by Hyuga. We've right? already drawn a lot of similarities <laughs> between Satan and Gandalf yeah. earlier in this podcast, anyways. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Same character archetype. Right? Yeah, I think the same, yeah, based on the same archetype. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, I just think that's funny that you bring that up <laughs> because we've already seen a number of parallels with Gandalf before. I like that one a lot. Has the halfling's leaf, or what is it? Well, has the your love, love of the halfling's of the leaf halflings slowed your mind? Leaf. Question mark. Clearly slowed your mind. Clearly. Good stuff. Um, so yeah, she's, she's, you know, talking down, being condescending. Um, I like how Sigurd here asks her why she's backing Shakan, and she's right. like, "Ha! Huh, you suggest the son of the murdered king Fatima? He refused to cooperate. You mean to say that now he wants to be our puppet all of a sudden?" So she's talking about how they had just 
yeah. when, when, when Bart was bringing Margie out and Ramses and Yang encountered them there. Mm. They tried to like get him not to, right, yeah. but he wouldn't cooperate with them. So she's right. like, well, he's not gonna be our sheep. Well, he's not gonna be our puppet. Right? Which is probably the reason why Bart's father was taken out in the first place. Yeah. So they're just looking for a puppet to install. Exactly. And so, cause I think Sigurd mentioned, Sigurd's like, hey, who cares who the king is, right? Like you, you want to have your power and, mm. but she's like, are you dumb? Like. If you defy me, then it's not helpful. Like, I don't yeah. want you to be king because you're going to defy me. And I really like also, she says, besides, stupidity in puppets has its advantages, as Shakan standing yes. right next to her. Yes, yes. To his face. I know. <laughs> and he's like, oh, stupid, what? <laughs> <laughs> and then she, she goes on to say, uh, we don't care who sits on the throne. Any obedient sheep would be fine. And the key word, obedience. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's really Gebler that's running this country. It's not yep. Chacon, right? Um, but the whole scene after this where Mason Mison shows up in well, the, the crab There helicopter. was that scene. So he, before this, he's like cleaning a mug. Oh, and he drops the glass. And it's, it's, a, it's a new glass or something so that it signifies the youngness and it fell and it broke and it was a, it was a, 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 a young item whose life was short-lived. <laughs> and somehow he was like, could this be an omen that the young well, master I is going to die? I thought he said this is the young master's cup. It's oh, like so it was his cup. cup. Okay, yeah, okay. I, yeah. So it was Bart's cup he was cleaning. Yes. And when it broke, he must have just dropped it or something. At first I didn't really know what happened because yeah, it's, like, it's a sound thing, but right. there's something weird, weird sounds going on. <laughs> um, but he's like, could this be? And I was like, oh, it broke. Okay. So he, it breaks and he interprets that as, oh, no, Bart's... In line, trouble. his lifeline is being cut short. Yeah. yeah, and so he rushes to with the land crab with Satan's. Yeah, Satan's kind of land crab. Is it land the crab. one? Is it? It's Satin's the same one. one? Okay, mm -hmm. it's the same one. He flies it in there, and uh, everyone gets inside and is like, "Who? Screw you, old bald geezer! We're out of here!" It was like a, <laughs> a pretty classic like yeah. escape. It breaks. <laughs> it falls back down. They're <laughs> <laughs> like, "Oh crap." But then he kind of just like, you know, walks it and jumps it out and of And jumps whatever. around, yeah. Mason's um, pretty adept for his yeah, age. He's, he's beast. Yeah. So anyways, it's kind of a funny little thing. Uh, I, like, I like the scene itself, but I don't like that we have it before we see Faye get through all of what he does. Because yeah, then yeah, when yeah. we're fighting with Faye, it's like we already know that the the plan has failed and what he's fighting for is in vain it's it's there's no purpose to you're it. you're right yeah and and it gets to the point where like in the script here it was like um oh i wonder if bart's okay it's like well mm -hmm. but we already know he's not we know that that's that does have some power this could have been done yeah. intentionally where it's like oh i wonder how bart is us knowing kind of like with the, the dude in Lahan Village who's like, hey, Faye, how are my wife and kids doing, right? Yeah. Where it's like, you know things went wrong, although Faye knows that's a character thing. Right, it's like this our, one, point it's just of, the our point of view character. You're, yeah, we're privy to things our point of view character doesn't know. Yes, so yes, therefore, yes. the stakes of the scene for that character are removed for us. Because yeah, it's like, fair enough, yeah. whether he s succeeds or fails, we already know the plan. We know that it didn't, didn't work. work. Yeah. Luckily, this all turns into a whole different thing. Because we, we stop just being a decoy and we start, because Graf shows up and yes. things kind of go wrong. So at least to that end, we don't end that scene where yeah. it's like, okay, now Bart can do what he needs to do. It's like, <laughs> no, halfway through, the whole thing kind of got screwed up anyway. I, I think I would have liked it had we played as Faye, all the way up to that point where he goes, I wonder how Bart's doing. Oh, no news is good news. He's probably fine. And, and then, then we switch cut. over. I agree. I we agree. go through that whole thing, and then we're yeah. going through Bart's point of view as he arrives. Maybe even all the way through the, the scene with Graf and, and, and Faye going crazy. Get all the way up through that, and then cut to white or something away from that. And then yeah. you're showing up with Bart, and you're seeing the red gear, and it's like, what the heck is this? What's going on? Right? Sure, yeah. Um, it's just a matter of just taking the scene and moving it over here a little bit, and it, yeah. I think it would work better. Yeah, it would have been. But it doesn't need to change anything as far as what happens. But um, I took a note on this. Um, we talked about, in, in that podcast a couple weeks ago, uh, repetitious dialogue, and we brought up the Robert McKee clip 
to explain it yes. a little bit. Yep. So in that scene, which is not, I, I tried to make a point on the fact, this is not like the worst example ever. And you know, right. you tried to point out maybe it was done for comedic effect. Right, and, like a, you know, yeah. Like it, and you know, tried to put a point on the fact that that is not like the, a, a scene that it's, you know, egregious or something like that. Sure. It's just to, it's an example to make a point on this thing that I am now going to hammer home with a very egregious example. <laughs> And that is when Graf shows up to talk to Vanderkamp. Mm. He references the power. Yes. In Chikara. Yes. In a one minute twenty something second scene, mm -hmm. ten times. Um, ten times they say the power. Oh, yeah. The the I mean, I, repetition yeah, I here that. is much much more egregious. Yes. Than Saitan talking about piracy in the other one. I agree, and this one can't really be interpreted as being intending to be funny. Well, I wanted to ask I about don't think. the Japanese. Oh, definitely not. Yes. Like this is not <laughs> supposed to be funny. I did look into the Japanese for this. But I wanted to see if he says power the same number of times. Chikara, in Japan. Chikara, Chikara. Okay, so yeah. let me find the specific part. I, I, I did look at it and it was We're going to go through each line, it, yes. but this my short answer is yes. This is this it. is exactly how something that's meant to be taken really seriously or with a lot of gravitas becomes silly yeah. very quickly. And mm -hmm. it's just in the fact that you're repeating the same language over and over again. And the language is vague to begin with. It's not specific. So whatever the power is, we don't know what he's, what he really means by that. Yes, we do The don't. power, yeah. the power, the power. And it starts to just sound... Although he does say, he does say, at least in this part, he says, um, uh, the power, the power that is hidden inside of you. Yeah. Right, the secret power that's like, oh, hold on, I wrote the translation. Um, the uh, blossom, oh yeah, he says, blossom, O fallen seed, and draw upon thy hidden powers. Right, that's yeah. after it's accepted, though. So yeah. I think that's kind of towards the end of this. Because yeah, he's trying to convince him about power over and mm -hmm. over and over. At the end, he says, blossom, O fallen seed, and draw upon thy hidden powers. Yeah. By the way, that's another reference in general to the you shall be as gods kind of right. concept, right? Right, that exactly. You have this innate power in you. I'm just bringing it forth. Yeah. That you you have the power of, of the gods. Let it shine. No. Yes. Right. Yeah. But in terms of the Japanese, let me keep looking. It's it is the number of the number of times he says power. <laughs> the power. Yes. Well, it's all the... here. So it's this symbol right here. Yeah. This one right here means power, and it is it's here, and it's here. And it's here. And anyways, it's it it's is all, it is quite common, and it's almost every text box. Yes, the entire conversation, the whole conversation. <laughs> so, and it's a uh, chikara. Is the you know, saying. Robert McKee talked about rule of thirds, right? He's like, the first time you say something, it'll have its maximum impact. The second time, it will have it maybe even less than yeah. half its impact. Yeah. The third time, it's going to have the opposite effect. People start laughing at you yes. instead of you know feeling what they're supposed to feel. And like I said, with the, with the example that we used last time, with Saitan bringing up piracy over and over again, mm -hmm. it's possibly meant to be humorous yes. in the first place. I can grant that. Because This being is evasive. definitely not supposed to be that. No. This is supposed to be intimidating, high um, stakes, you know, a, 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 an elevated level of gravitas to the yes. scene. It, and, and you have that, that, that music. Dun, 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 yes. dun, 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 yeah, It's cool. Bah. It's like... This is supposed to be really intense. And so you have just a text over the screen as Graf is approaching, right? Because Vanderkam has lost. So his, his backup plan, I guess we skipped over this, was that little machine uh, with the arms on it. He comes and fights yeah. you in a big boss fight. And it's and something. Can, it can like shoot like He, can, he can grab like your, the guys in your party. And yeah. he's like holding him. And if you attack, he'll do this crazy counterattack. It's mm -hmm. actually, it, it can be for this point of the game, kind of a tough boss fight. Yeah. Because you got to manage your fuel really well, mm -hmm. and um, you got to make sure that you avoid the counterattacks, and you can't heal in gears just yet. So it's like you've been taking a beating right. all the way up through the fights up to this point. You can't. And then heal. now there's this. Yeah. So with it being yeah. like structured the way it is, it, 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 there's a likelihood if you don't know what you're doing, you could probably die on this fight. Yeah. But w once you beat him, he's like, "Oh no, what do I do?" Right? Vandercom's kind of uh, uh, freaking out. And then we just see on the screen, do you want the power? And he's like, what? And then you see Graf fly in and he comes down. I am, so we have one reference there. I, do you want the power? And then Graf says, I am Graf, the seeker of power, number two. 
Doth thou desire the power? Three. So he's already broken the rule of thirds with the first three sentences. <laughs> he's referenced the power in the first three yeah. sentences. He's just getting started. And he's just getting started. <laughs> so Vanderkam says, the power? <laughs> and Graf says, yes, the power. <laughs> but we have five times. Five lines, five the power references. Yeah. That's, I'm sorry, it's just not great writing. Like, mm. I, I, if you don't want to hear that from me, go take a creative writing class and ask, take this dialogue to any, anyone who teaches creative writing. They'll tell you the same thing. Then Vanderkam says, power, the power, I want it, I want the power. Yes. And then Graf says, so be it, my fit, now this part's kind of cool. My fist is the divine breath, blossom, O fallen seed, and draw upon thy hidden powers, grant unto thee the power of the glorious mother of destruction. Ten. Ten times they say the power or reference powers or the power. Power, 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 power. Repeated over and over and over again. By the end of that, it starts to sound really silly because the power is a vague concept. We don't know precisely at this point what he's even right. talking about. So they're hammering home a concept that we, we that don't even, we don't it, even know. What none of this about. dialogue yeah. is clarifying what he is talking about. And yeah. he's just saying the same in the, using the same language, saying the same thing over and over and over again, and we've gotten nowhere in terms of like our understanding of what he's doing. Yeah. It's just the whole thing is a giant, the power, the power, the power, the power, and we don't so, know what he's talking about. Oh, what's, this new, what's this new Final Fantasy game coming out called? Oh, you're talking about, <laughs> um, yes, this is a great example. You're talking about uh, Strangers in Paradise or Strangers of Paradise. Sure. Uh, yeah. Final Fantasy. It's supposed to be like a, kind of a, a redo of Final Fantasy One kind okay. of thing. Okay. All right. Where well, they say chaos they talk about a million chaos. times. Yes. yes. And exactly right. there's a lot about chaos and how you can't let chaos, but you don't know what chaos is. And so... <laughs> Unless you've you're, played FF1, I guess. Oh, sure, I yeah. suppose. But you're kind of stuck watching this trailer where they're referencing a thing over and over and being like, like it's just, you know, it, it was not, it should, it could have been put together with a little more thought, probably. Well, and, the, and this is exactly, this is, that is a very perfect example to uh, elucidate the point, right? Yeah. What was clearly meant to be a dark, mm. like, take on yeah. FF1, right? This yes. gritty, dark, grungy, serious, mm -hmm. like, intense take on it. Is made, was immediately made into a meme. Is made laughable, yeah. It was yeah. immediately turned into a yeah. joke, and the whole internet spread that joke all over the internet. Yeah. Because it sounds funny if you it just does. repeat, I hate chaos, I want to kill chaos, I, it's <laughs> not even like, what does he say? It's like, it's, uh, it's like a thirst. It's, <laughs> it's like so important to me to kill chaos. I so, hate chaos. You know what's like, funny is in the game, those references to chaos may actually be well spread out. Yeah, but in the trailer, they just so they just condensed it all together to where it's laughable. It's funny. And it, become, it yeah. became a meme, right? Yeah. People found it funny. They start making jokes about it. That's why you don't want to repeat the same thing over and over again. If your intention is not for the audience to laugh, but to take the bad guy seriously and to be yeah. afraid of the bad guy. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason you don't repeat things over and over again. You know, also, once again, sometimes when you are reading things, you don't notice this kind of stuff as much as when you're hearing it or yeah. if you're reading it out loud. <laughs> right. Right. And so for this particular scene, I didn't count to 10 quite. I knew it was a couple. It was like three, four, maybe five-ish, you know, for pushing it. And I did look it up later on to see the yeah. the words he was using for power and all that stuff. And mother of destruction, by the way. Um, yes. But I didn't um, make this, I didn't realize how, just how often the word power had been said yeah. in such a short period of time, um, having not actually heard it, just having read it on my own, you know. Right. But yes, cutting to the point, he talks about granting the power of the glorious mother of destruction. Yes. And that's the key thing that we should, you know, yes. put a pin in, remember for later. Yeah, because I don't know if this is referencing Mother God or if this is a whole different thing. Sure. Mother of destruction. In this case, mother could mean, like, what did they call the atom bomb? It was like the, didn't they call it the mother of all bombs? Mother of all bombs, I think, yeah. Or, I could Something be wrong about like that, that, but that's a common expression, the sure. mother of all whatever, right? Mm -hmm. um, it could be just like massive destruction, or he could be referring specifically to God, the God, goddess, or a goddess. It's a little few too many, or just an abstract concept. So there's like four separate things that could be referred to here. Yeah. But 
Anyways, Graf grants some power to Vandercom. Vandercom starts like shooting ether beams or something around. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. Um, now, on the back of that criticism of the writing there, I really love the way they handle Ramses. In the whole game, but like particularly in the scene. Um, is this the next one as we come back to Yeah, uh, so Bart? like, so like, basically his yeah. ship attacks Bart's ship. And Bart gets hit oh, by a couple torpedoes. I had a note here, because I didn't know. Do you know what a baffle is? A baffle? Yeah. No. It said, so Bart is driving their sand cruiser, right? Just uh. chilling. And all of a sudden, Ramses is like there, like out of nowhere. And uh. the dolphin, <laughs> the, <laughs> the dolphin Fra man. Franz. Franz. <laughs> Franz uh, says, oh, they were hiding behind the baffles. Um, I oh. can detect them now. I looked Let's it up see. in Japanese. It is... Katakana, it is bafu eru. It is the same word, it's bafu. Well, I looked it up, and I still don't know quite what it means, but apparently it's what you would use to block a, so a source yeah. of energy. A device used to restrain the flow of a fluid gas or loose material, or to prevent the spreading of sound or light in a particular direction. So they were hiding behind a, a device that prevented You can cut out something? glare from a strip light by concealing it behind a baffle. Well, just covering it, I guess. Uh, There's just like a covering. So maybe maybe the engine, you know how an engine is like shooting out power, but then there's like a ring around it that's like a cuff kind yeah. of, that's like, that maybe could be a type of baffle. That's more a direction. So anyways, this? I kind of just didn't know what it was talking about. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm sorry. I'm looking at a, like an image here. To, so a baffle. Baffle this. Oh, and so the baffle. Oh, so that's keeping the light shining straight. Yeah. Interesting. It's interesting. Okay. Either way, I didn't know what that word meant, and I don't know who does know what that word means unless you're an engineer. <laughs> but looking it up, I see many diagrams. I can yeah, see here's what a, a baffle a YouTube is. YouTube heat exchanger, and we got the baffle is inside of this. Hmm. I don't know exactly. That's what, that what Ramses was hiding behind. I guess so. Yeah. Was that so? I I took it to be like a blind Maybe spot. There's like the a blind, blind spot, spot on yeah. on the baffle of uh, um, the Yggdrasil. Yes. Yeah. So the Yggdrasil has a, a a device that it has a purpose, but it also it, it creates a blind spot. Has to do with heat exchange in the sure, engine with the or engines. something like that. I think that's there's reasonable. probably a, some kind of baffle or something in there that would hide the signature or something. Ah, sure. Of so it's like a cloak Ramses kind of thing. ship. So he was oh. he's. Oh, Ramses' ship is in it? pursuit, and like, they're not able to, maybe there's a blind spot in, I don't know if you want to call it sonar or something like that, because he's in this specific he's the injury, spot energy that is being way. hidden by this baffle could be in the engine of the Yggdrasil. If anyone yes. knows this, that's my best guess. Yes, what that, that would be. be awesome, actually. But this sounds like, I think that that sounds about right. Yeah. That there was, there was a place, somehow Ramses knew exactly where to be in order to conceal his ship, that typically you can't just do that so easily. Like right. you have to hide behind a certain part of the ship that Ramses knew about. Yeah. It seems. Well, that that would be cool because that would show Ramses like, um, what's the word for it? Like expertise, I guess. Sure. In yeah. terms of his maneuverability, foresight. his term, uh, yeah, like so strategy. All, maybe all sand cruisers, I call it a sand cruiser. There's a word for it. Um, like he knows the enemy ship so they well. They all have this certain thing or something. He like knows that, exactly yeah. where to hide strategically uh, to avoid yeah. detection. He knows exactly how to attack this thing right. because he knows the ship he's fighting against. Yes. Like he's a very smart, strategic battle commander, right? That seems to be the case. Uh, also because he foresaw all the, everything. Not only yeah. did he foresee all the events happening, which it could be that he physically saw them because they're, you know, but he foresaw them somehow and then also even like knew where to be. Like he's very, very uh, prepared. Well, That's and we, we, talked, about, we prepared. talked about in the last episode that part of war is being able to risk everything, right? Yes. With the assumption that your enemy will not believe you're willing to go to that take far that or take yeah, the risk. Yes, Ramses yes. knows Saitan, and he knew exactly what he would be willing to do, mm. and he totally saw it. To ahead know of your enemy, yeah, yeah. So Ramses knew Saitan better than Saitan realized Ramses knew him mm -hmm. better than he knew Ramses, I guess, in this case. Just love the halfling's leaf, man. <laughs> Saitan is just. 
He's he's it slow. slowed his mind. He's, he's clearly <laughs> his mind has clearly been slowed. <laughs> Anyways, I really like the way the character Ramses is handled in the scene. Right, like as soon as he basically has the Yggdrasil not completely um, taken down, they didn't sink it. It was and, like sixty percent. Yeah, they didn't like totally disable it, but they got it to a yeah. point where it's like you cannot out maneuver me. Now. Yeah, it's yeah. If we want to, we can kill. We you will now. shoot you down now. Well. This is where Miang brings up, like, hey, why aren't you just killing, why right. aren't you ending this right now? Yeah. And Ramses is just kind of thinking to himself. Well, he's, he says... Because they could. They have him, like, like almost dead in their tracks. Yeah. And the and plan was to, like, bury them under, And he says, well, what shall we do with them? And she's like, it's not like you to get lost like this, right? Yeah. And he says, I promised an old friend I must take it easy. An old friend. And then we have a flashback there when the, the moment, I guess, that Sigurd dissented or that he left uh, Gebler. Yeah. And, and, and Ramses is like chasing after Running him. Like, like, hey, why what? are you leaving? Yeah. We were supposed to fight together. Yeah. You know, what about our ideals? Yeah, do you not believe in the cause? And Sigurd's answer is, is interesting there. Because he's like, actually that. all along I wasn't with you. I was uh, coming to like steal spy and steal your technology yeah. and stuff. Yeah. And I have somebody waiting for me. So screw you, I'm leaving. Right. Um, it seems purposefully harsh. It yeah. seems like he was being more harsh than he needed to be on purpose, though. Yeah. I think they were close. I don't know this. This is just kind of what I got, but it y typically a scene like this would be written um, for, let's say there's a guy who needs to break up with a girl <laughs> and he he has to break up with her because he has cancer and he doesn't want her to watch oh, him and sure. he's going to die and she needs to move on, right? What he will do then is he will approach her and say, I never liked you to begin with. Yeah. I only just, I was yeah. I was faking my emotions the whole time and I hate you and I have no feelings for you. That's what he'll say. And then he'll go to his room and cry that he had to break <laughs> up with her. Like that's, that's how this scene would play out. That's yeah. what I'm getting from this dialogue is that Sigurd feels like he has to go. He feels bad for abandoning Ramses. He doesn't want Ramses to follow him. He doesn't, he wants, um, he wants Ramses to hate him so that uh, it'll be easier on Ramses that, oh man, that guy was such a jerk in the end. Instead of like, oh, I lost a dear friend. It's like, oh, we became enemies right at the end and then he left. Now I don't feel so bad about him leaving. Mm. It, it feels like a friendship kind of thing for me. And that's me yeah. not knowing how not this game knowing ends up, comes by up. the way. But that's how it seems like it was written. Yeah, I kind of saw it as being like Ramses' perspective on how that exchange went. Ah, so like, maybe he's misremembering slightly about how and, and harsh Sigurd was. I don't know was. if that's intentional or not, but it just, it's kind of this, because we already got Sigurd and Saitan's, I guess, perspective on this, right? Yeah, Which was yeah. Ramses. They grew disillusioned. Ramses at first seemed like he wanted to change the society. Yeah, but once but he, he got in power. Really he, was he just like, wanted to make people like him yes. be the ones in power. Yeah. Now, but Ramses believes what he's doing is like a higher ideal. And yes, so of course when he, he runs out <laughs> to chase Sigurd, he's being very like, Don't you believe in our genuine. cause? Genuine. Yeah. Like, what about, you know, we believe in the same things. Why are you mm -hmm. doing this? And Sigurd's response is all cold and actually I'm a traitor and like I'm... And, and yeah. that, that might be more of like Ramses, the way he saw the situation but maybe not necessarily how it went down. I'm not saying that this is canon. I'm just saying that that's kind of how I read the scene because it's, it's Ramses- some, There's something weird about the scene. It's Ramses remembering yeah. from his perspective. Mm -hmm. And we got a kind of a different perspective from Sigurd. Now, the same yeah. thing happens. Sigurd grew disenfranchised with mm -hmm. Ramses' ideals and left. Yeah. But here he's like, no, the whole time I was just here to steal, uh, you know, spy on you and steal tech. When, right. when in actuality he was brought there by As a slave, Solaris right? Yeah, it was like to a different... be experimented on. Yeah, so so he didn't come there on purpose at all, let alone to <laughs> steal the tech. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so that's why. Yeah, that's why I kind of take what he's saying as feeling like, oh, there's there's an ulterior motive behind this, and the fact that he's so harsh kind of for me reveals a I little bit that, that yeah. Sigurd is is a, an emotional guy, and he he doesn't want their friendship to. He knows the friendship's over, but he doesn't want to hurt Ramses that much. So he's making it easier on Ramses by pretending to be just a horrible jerk that Ramses can just forget about. Right. So, but I, the reason I like this is because Ramses is really conflicted about just shooting down the Yggdrasil and killing Sigurd, right? 
And so he tries to give them a chance again. He tried yes. to give Bart a chance. He tried to give Margie a chance. He's mm -hmm. trying to give Sigurd a chance here. He's like, okay, um, we won't do anything to Nissan if mm -hmm. you just surrender. Right. Nissan will be spared entirely mm -hmm. of any possible uh, uh, conspiracy between you and them against us mm -hmm. if you just stop. Now this is, of right. everything that Ramses did, right? Like Ramses w saw ahead of his enemy. He knew his enemy mm -hmm. well, but he d he wasn't willing to go that next step. You and know, so yes, failing, that's a good point. What was he willing to do? Are you really willing to go that far? And he yeah. wasn't willing to just kill Satan and Sigurd and just like end yeah. it. He wasn't his, willing to do his that. His failing as a commander in this mm -hmm. instance was he could not let go of his yeah. attachment to the previous elements members. Now, when you say failing, mm -hmm. you're speaking purely from a strategic standpoint. Yes, because. Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, there are some bad people who are just grand successes. Sure, um, that's yes, you, you're. But correct. that that's is it, from a, from a military standpoint. Yeah. Yes. It's like he he's weak. He he has a weakness that can then be exploited, be exploited. by the enemy, which right. is which is then exploited. So by. it's like he didn't totally disable the ship. He didn't totally destroy the ship. So they yeah. take an act of desperation that he but, did not think they would do. But his weakness in reality is a strength. Yes, correct. <laughs> okay. okay. So uh, Sigurd decides to put into effect uh, something called, uh, I think it's Bern Bernoulli's or Bern somebody told me how to pronounce this, Bernoulli's I principle. I didn't look into this one. So I was like, is that a real thing? Because mm -hmm. he's like, according to Bernoulli's principle, it's, it's basically Is it what, a vibration? It's what creates loft. It's, it's, it's um, like, basically like air or an increase in, in speed of a fluid ah, I see what occurs saying. simultaneously with a decrease in pressure or a decrease in the fluid's potential energy. Um, he was a Swiss mathematician, Daniel uh, Bernoulli. And um, so the idea, like I have um, Idris's pieces, who's uh, one of our patrons who was watching at mm. the time. He's an aerospace engineer, oh. so he, he kind of started to explain it to me. Did but he tell us about the FF-8, the, the missile? Um, no, different okay, guy. Okay, that was somebody else. By the way. That was pretty cool. <laughs> there was somebody else who responded to that guy who is actually a missile, nice. like he works on like yeah. missile systems, mm -hmm. who said that guy was wrong. <laughs> oh, great. So oh, I didn't end great. up bringing that up at the end of it, but there was an additional point from a guy who's actually like designing missile systems who was like, yeah, the FF8 thing is total BS. Like, <laughs> so, okay, whatever. All right. Well, if you don't know what we're talking about, watch the <laughs> FF8 podcast, please. It had to do with, I don't even remember what it was. It was like, um, anyways, go watch it. I well, you find fine. multiple missiles, a, a but wider what was range the term means they use. It was like, it was like, spread. it was like. Oh, um, is it just accuracy? Just it wasn't, it drop wasn't down accuracy, the accuracy, but it was something precision, like something like that. I can't remember it either. What was the term? I forget. Anyways, we were on a whole cycle. Error. Error. Error the ratio. Error ratio. The error ratio. Yeah, and we just turned it way up. Yeah. But that that created a wider circle. So but apparently that's the wrong. one guy was a mathematician who tried to explain why error ratio makes sense. Sure. The missile missile system guy said, "No, that's not at all how it works, and that's BS." Okay, so cool. whatever. Great, Anyways. Great. Not to discredit the other guy, it's just everybody's has in different fields. I don't know what the F is going on. Mathematically it made sense, but <laughs> it may not be practical, you know. I'm just reporting what the experts <laughs> tell me. I don't know what's going on. Oh, that's funny. Okay, Bernoulli's principle though, right? I was surprised to learn this is actually a real thing. So they're gonna use this to create loft, to, mm. to the Yggdrasil to fly essentially. They're gonna get it to like launch yeah. into the air. Um, it's kind of funny because, and this is something that um, I struggled a little bit with when I was writing my book too, using real world, like mm. our world principles, scientific in principles, a, in a fantasy. named after people, scientists, physicists who lived yeah. in this world, <laughs> but using that term for a world that is not Earth. Um, this is the kind of thing where I just say, I, I let it go, whatever. <laughs> I get the principle. He, he's using the principle to, you know, the speed. I don't think the, they the needed to explain to, a principle to us, though. But. I don't think that they need to explain it, but he yeah. just said, we're going to use Bernoulli, Bernoulli's principle to create loft. Sure. Bernoulli obviously didn't live in the world of Xenogear, so it would no. not have been called that. But how else do you 
reference what it is they're doing to people from Earth playing the video say, game. You could just say, hey dudes, watch, I'm about to do something crazy. You could do that too, right? <laughs> to avoid yeah. the inconsistency, right, of using a term that would not exist in and the world. That, and that very few people understand anyways. Anyways. So, yeah. But so, they do that a lot in this game, so. But, and, and it's not the last time. There's gonna be other things that come up yeah. where it's like, why would that thing exist in this world? It's one of those things I just choose to go, whatever, let it go. Mm. Um, but it is kind of funny, because I was like, I was reading it, and I was like, that sounds made up, but I don't, now that I think about it, it must not be. That's probably a real thing. And then, sure enough, they yeah. start coming at me in the chat, and they're like, yeah, this is real, and this is what it is, and this is how it works. And I tried to ask him, hey, based on what they said there, is this actually possible, what he's saying? And he's like, well, it's vague enough to where like, yeah, you could buy it. Technically, but that ship is so big. It's huge. To get that momentum. It's like, Ugh. they don't say specifically yeah. what they do, but so it's vague enough for me to buy it, but at the same mm. time, we don't know the specifics and I don't know, I couldn't tell you whether or not that ship is capable of that or whatever. So it's like, okay, fine. <laughs> They launched the freaking Idrisil in the air. That's <laughs> there, what happens. There was another line here talking about um, how certain of their systems were broken that was making it so. It seemed to me like there was like a, a vibration system that vibrates the sand around them, which makes it like yeah. liquid, like liquefaction, I think is what they call it, that makes it so that they're able to travel in the sand. Yeah. And that if they don't have it, if that shuts down, then it's just the sand hardens and then they're just stuck in the middle of sand. Right. I was wondering how they were traveling through the sand. And it seems like they gave me a pretty good answer, actually. It was kind of cool. That yeah. I was like, oh, no way, because when an earthquake happens, that's a problem. Yeah. If you're in sand and an earthquake happens, you'll sink into the sand. sand. Right. And then when the earthquake's over, you're stuck in concrete, right? Yeah. Like, you're, you can't get out. Like, yeah. it's really hard. And so that's what they're doing with these ships. They're, they're like, vibrating the sand enough to where they can pass it, like, through it. Softens like it. water. Yeah, like yeah. liquid. Like mm -hmm. liquefaction is what it's referring to. And then they can travel around, like, super fast. I don't know if it's really technically possible, but at least they gave me something that's like, okay, yeah. that makes sense. That's kind of cool. There's actually a, a lot of things like this. If you read Perfect Works, which is like the companion <laughs> book, they do mm -hmm. describe a lot of like the technicalities of how oh, the gears yeah. work. Like that's I remember cool. I was watching like all the scenes inside of the cockpits of mm -hmm. the gears. It's like they have a panoramic like set of what looks like windows going all the way around their head. Right. But it's, it's like, like they're not underground. That's not what the gear, like the gear is made of whatever kind of steel, you know, yeah. is on the outside. There's no windows on it. Right. So what's actually happening is that those are all uh, monitors. Yeah. And so okay. there must be That's cameras cool. on the outside of the ship that makes that sense. Display so on the monitor on the inside of the gear. Right? Yeah. So That's when cool. when someone Faye's cool. sitting in there and he's got these what looks like windows and he can see all the way around him in all directions mm. you know, as he's piling the gear. He's not looking through glass or through a transparent I object. See, I see. It's a monitor that's, you know, showing him what a camera on the outside must be broadcasting inside. I've heard of uh, some tech like that being used by the military currently with like um, like Air Force fighter jets and yeah. stuff. That the pilot will have some some not always, but in some special cases, the pilot will have a certain the fighter pilot will have a certain like AR yeah. kind of system that he's seeing through where he's not actually, but that way he can look down. Like, you look down, you're seeing a cockpit, but if you're a bomber, that's a problem. You can't yeah. see quite where you're over the target right. or not, you know? But if you can have a perfect, like, view where you can look around via a camera, but it just looks real, you know? Yeah. Like, that's 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 real tech, and that's pretty cool. Yeah, so that's how that works. Anyways, Perfect Works has a lot of cool things nice. that explain how the tech is works. Is Perfect Works just Xenogears, or is it all the Xenogears Xeno stuff? Okay. Xenogears cool. alone, yeah. Cool. Um, <clears throat> now, a couple things here. Uh, the Red Warrior. Can, yeah, can this we, dude shows up out of nowhere. Do you want to ask you, if I know who it is? Do you know who this is? I have two guesses. I okay. have two guesses. Okay. And this is unfortunate. The one guess is that that person is whoever the heck we fought in the um, in the arena. That oh, the the, the, clo the guy? blue cloak person, or it's our dad. I don't know, and I okay. could be wrong about all of this. I, that's all I could think of because I couldn't. I can't tell okay. who this is. Thank you so for don't clarifying <laughs> that, so that I can avoid saying some things. I could Kay. not tell, <clears throat> but it's possible that I missed some obvious dialogue points. But I so cannot tell who that was. So Bart says to him, "Why? Are, what are you suddenly attacking me for?" And the Red Warrior says, <laughs> "Fine, then play dumb." 
Um, I was gonna make a point on that, but I will hold that off for later. Um, but this, this red warrior <clears throat> shows up and starts wrecking stuff. And Ramses, as soon as he sees that the red warrior is there, right? He starts Yeah, he freaks it. out. And he gets in his... Mm. Um, his gear. Gear, and he is like squashed he, like immediately. He calls him the demon of Elru. Now, El Elru is. is a continent in this world. It's like south of Ignis, mm. um, kind of southeast. And um, we'll learn later about what happened there specifically, but it's part of his memory from his dream. The, he's the demon of Elru. That, that it, uh, mm. demonstration that was happening there that Graf was overseeing, where yeah. he killed everybody, and, and uh, uh, Ramses was like, oh, stop him or whatever, you know, that whole scene. Right. That happened in Elru, oh, the, okay, the continent okay. of Elru. So he's calling him the demon of Elru. Right? Uh, that's, what, that's what that reference is when he says that. So this is the, the guy who he's dreaming and having nightmares about, and he wants revenge on him very, very badly. So he's like, drop everything, get my gear ready, I'm going out to meet him right now. But he doesn't <laughs> do anything. Immediately, I love I this. I thought, because I was like, all right, we're gonna see Ramses fight, this is gonna be good. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, not only was it not good, I guess it was good in a different kind of way, but um, it was like, I'm pretty sure he does a few hits, right? Yeah. And then, boom, 9,999 damage yeah. from the Demon of Elru, and he's just out. And immediately he's like, curse you, and he's like all broken. And well, like, like, yeah, because he, like he, he basically shows up, why he's did got he, a sword. Why did he think he could, he could hurt this guy? <laughs> he's got a sword, and he's like, right away, he's like, all right, let's do this. And the first thing that happens, he grabs him and like tears his arm off. And That's then just right. like throws him into the That's ground. That's right, oh just, my god, Just it was brutal. didn't stand a chance. It was brutal, <laughs> yeah. And, and Miang picks him up and he's like, no, like I still got one arm left. He's like, yeah, this is a waste of time. We're out of here. So she <laughs> takes him out and then, and then he's facing Bart. And Bart's watching this like, oh, okay. <laughs> and you know, you, you, you can fight him for a couple of rounds. You do a little bit of damage. And then as soon as he, his turn goes, yeah, it's like almost 20,000 damage. It's like yeah. the first attack, it seems like what is typically the maximum which is 9,999, mm -hmm. but then he, the death blow continues and it I know, goes it up to 19,900 <laughs> yeah. something. And it's like, whoa, yeah. this dude's way too powerful to fight. So Bart gets taken out there and th that's when the Yggdrasil, which had launched, comes crashing down on top, on top of, of the yes. red gear. In fact, I believe that Sigurd recognized the red gear as well, and he was aiming for that. As they yeah. were going, Sigurd was like, oh no, and he tried to crush the red gear on part, like he was aiming yeah, for that. because he's trying to help Bart. Which great, because so Bart, Bart jumps out of the way, and I guess, but this dude didn't and need just, to. And just, boom, just lands right on top of him. And then one of the coolest shots in the <laughs> whole game, he just like lifts it up, and yeah. it's just holding it there, and like the, the, the weight, the Yggdrasil's weight, I guess, is just like kind of folding down around. Yeah, As he's yeah. just like holding it right there in the center. And it that's where... It just like where... folds, folds. Yeah, And he's crazy. just holding it up and, 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 and he says, uh, that was pretty interesting, but dropping a warship on me is cheating. Take it back. And he throws it Take at Bart. It back. But slowly. It's like a slow throw. Yeah. I, I kind of saw that as being like slow motion. Oh, like, gosh. <laughs> Not like I missed literally it. That slow, was over my head. It like, was just. It's like he's in slow motion. He's dude, throwing. I was so confused. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, oh, he's slowly. He's giving him a chance. Okay, to it's slowly away. coming. Oh man. Um, but also, Saitan uh, Sigurd insists that Saitan escape before this all happens. Really, you got to get out of here like right now. And so they put him in an escape pod, and he shoots out, and. I thought it, it was a little bit weird at first because he's in his gear and after, after he lands from the pod, he's in his gear and he goes in his gear and he goes and approaches the, uh, the so machine. So his whole gear went in the pod? The machine, that it must have been, but All I right. find that strange because gears very strange. can fly. <laughs> so he didn't have to do the So the only thing I can thing. think of is huh. that they must, when they were hit by the torpedoes, yeah. they, they did mention closing off certain sections so that they wouldn't sink, so that the sand wouldn't come in and sink the ship. Hmm. So maybe like the bay doors were gonna stay closed. And so he just got in his gear and got into an escape pod and shot out because they wouldn't have been able to open the door so he could fly out or something from the hangar. 
That's the only thing I can think of because it was just weird. Like he's in an escape pod, but the escape pod has his gear in it, but gears can fly. So I don't know. Anyway, whatever. Interesting. He gets out though. By the way, I figured out. I know who the red one, uh, the red thing is. It's Dan. <laughs> <laughs> Dan. He, it's Dan he's all secretly. Along. He's been plotting, and he's he's got the <laughs> injections, and he's he's like in the thing, and he figured out how to pilot a gear, and there you go, it's Dan. Mystery solved. Okay, um, but what Saiten says, because he sees the wreckage of Vandercom's machine that he had fought in, and he goes up to it, and he's and like, "Oh, this is like uh, when it happened." He said before, something. Right? He said something about how he was careless of him to have left it somewhere. Let me see if I can look this up specifically. Almost as if Saiten had like worked on that machine or something, or had in the past owned it or something like that. Mm. Uh, let me see. Let me get the exact dialogue here. Okay, we got Ramses and Franz and Mason. Here we go. Yeah, so Saiten lands and he's like, I'm being carried by the wind to the vicinity of the border. What is that? He sees in the distance. That is the Dora. Yeah. It was stationed here. That was careless of me, right? So it's like, that machine, it's something about that- That Vandercom was in? Yeah. It's called the Dora, and Saiten's like, oh, that, that machine was stationed here in Ave, in the Gebra? Oh, darn, that was careless of me. I shouldn't have allowed that to happen. Like, right? he has power over what's stationed where for Ave. Yeah, so it's, it's like, but it's condition. It is just like the others that he destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what quotations. I took to mean, yeah. So the fact that he is in quotations, right, is... Yes. Yeah. Well, this, I think the only time we saw this before was in Ramses' dream, right? That Ramses had a dream uh, when he was with Niang in bed, and it was like there was a he kind of thing. I, also, I guess Satan said if he wakes up here. Yeah, in the there's that. There's that one in, in Lahan, Lahan as well. As well. Yeah. So either way, it's a reference to, I suppose, phase, like immense power, right? Yeah. Okay. Dora? Is Dora. that what that thing was called? Dora is the name of oh, the. That's um, so funny. Is the name of that machine, I guess. So from this point, we basically cut away to the capital of Kisla, which is a city called Nortun, Nortun, and um, you have the Kaiser Sigurd, the the no, not Sigurd, <laughs> Sigmund, who is oh, the, Sigmund, like the yeah. leader of uh, Kisla, right? And he's playing uh, like on an organ. And uh, like an officer comes in to make a report. And um, by the way, I just have to throw this out here. The the Japanese did not say that he did a mistake. What does it say? For Satan, the Japanese here is a little different. Um, he says, "Oh well, it's the same. You know, it's the 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 result is the same, anyways." Yeah. Okay. So in this state, so Shikashino. Yeah. So. It, it, it's, oh, so it was deployed here. Oh, that's interesting. In this state, oh well, everything turned out the way it should have, anyways. Like that's oh, kind of what okay. he's saying here. Oh well, it all went. It all went. To plan. Yeah, it, what happened Regardless. happened, and we didn't lose anything. Interesting. Right? Like, and so. But he's still surprised to find. Oh that yeah, it was he's there. and he said specifically. Oh, it was stationed here. Yeah, Korewa. Oh, Dora. Oh yeah, it was stationed here. Oh my gosh. Oh well. Anyways. Everything worked out. Like okay. that's that's what he's saying in Japanese. He mm. doesn't quite say the mistake thing, but I suppose you can infer that. So sure, yeah. Now that I kind of say it out loud, it, it is more or less saying the same thing. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, this this officer comes in to give a report on to, to Sigma, um, and they report that two thirds of the Ave Gebler forces were taken out yeah, by an explosion. Yeah, by the one by that yeah. big explosion in the desert. Um, at the border, that there was all this radiation that was released from it. It was like this huge disaster, right? And it's like yeah. totally devastated their enemy, according to Kislev's enemy forces at that border. Yeah, like, so there's some advisors trying to say, hey, we should invade Ave right yeah, now. Are we not going to attack <laughs> now? And the, uh, who is it? The, the Sigmund, king. Yeah. Kaiser. Yeah. He's just playing his organ and he's just like not listening and they're like, we should go take over Ave. And he's like, that's when he stops. He's like, that. Like, what would be the point of that? Because, like, the whole the whole conversation, he's just kind of, like, nonchalantly playing this organ and listening to me. Oh, okay. And what about this? And he'll give him the report. Mm -hmm. and he's like, okay, okay. And he keeps playing, and the guy's kind of just, like, waiting for him to give the yes. order. And he's like, 
are we not gonna attack Avi now? And he stops. Yeah. Are you trying to destroy Kislev? <laughs> exactly. So this is funny. And the fact that he's playing organ when he's supposed to be conducting presidential duties sure, anyways, yeah. kind of tells you a little bit. It, it tells you that he's not, things are, things are out of his control and he's yes. just doing, he's just passing the time while things are run. He's not in charge and he knows he's not in charge. Maybe everyone doesn't know all of his government people. They don't yeah. all know he's not in charge, but he knows that he's not actually in charge. He can just play the organ all day and just <laughs> let things happen around him and it won't make a difference if he was actively working, you know? Yeah. And I kind of got that from this scene. And That's he's like, yeah. he's like, what, so what, we take Ave and then Gebler like just shows back up. Like if they don't want us to have Ave, then we, we're not gonna have Ave. If they yeah. want us to have Ave, they'll give it to us. They'll like, just put it. What do we do? We kill Shikhan, they'll put another puppet guy in his yes, place. Yes, exactly. And they will reinforce. Ave's depleted, but but Gebler is yeah. not. And they will act as the military. It's like, well, there's no point. There's no yeah. point. It will exhaust all our resources yeah. taking this and then they'll just come and mm -hmm. take it back anyway. Because they're in control. They're in control of Kislev as well. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so, that's actually a good takeaway. Um, yeah. But he also is totally aware that Bart, the prince, who he is and the fact that yeah. he's alive. And at this point I was kind of yeah, thinking, yeah. who doesn't know this by now? It's like, all the Gebler forces know, Shakan knew. I know. <laughs> like, so everybody Bart knows. thought it was a secret. Oh, you know who didn't know was that old man at the bottom of the well. He's like the <laughs> only one who didn't know. <laughs> and he actually knew Bart. Yeah, he's the only one who didn't know. Everyone else. It's like only like nobodies and peasants didn't know. But you know like what's weird though? Everybody important knew. Satan didn't know. I wonder right? if he didn't know if he was just not well, letting sure, on. Sure, but he knew. for the game, he always lets on when he because he can't help himself but yeah. to. And so the fact that Kislev and Ev and Shakan knew something that Satan didn't know is interesting. Unless Satan was really he, just playing dumb. Yeah. Unless he was just trying to get Mason to talk. Although, you know what, you're right, because he said he does have a certain, like, weight bearing about it. Yeah, bearing. Yeah. So he he was commenting that, oh, he seems royal, as if he did know. Yeah. I think you're right. There's yeah. a subtext there that he probably did actually know. Sight knows everything. Well, that's hilarious. So Bart <laughs> spent, like, ten years of his life in hiding. Where and everybody like, knows Everyone knew alive. he was alive. <laughs> so, <laughs> anyways, oh, it was kind of funny. funny. But Kislev knows, Ave knows that he's alive. Clearly, um, Rams just knew. So yeah. then the officer... Uh, and, and Sigmund, they both reference them a, a couple times in the scene in quotes, right? Yes. So the officer says, that gear that they recovered from this, which is Veltal. The Veltal, yeah. That gear wasn't made by us. The stock body was brought in by them. And then later on, Sigmund says, it seems they have arrived when the ship kind of like comes in. and That's a crazy looking pocket. ship too. It's like a sphere. Yeah, it's, it's like it's not like, aerodynamic It's like all. a fishbowl shape. It's like yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's the weirdest little thing, and it just kind of docks. Um, so there's some people that come out of that when it docks. Yeah. They're, they're not there for very long. They basically just mm. come show up to like have an, a quick exchange, and then they yes. leave again. <laughs> it's a... like that might have been more efficient to have a call or something I rather know, than like for real, fly right? down there to talk. Yeah. But uh, there's a masked woman with a couple soldiers mm -hmm. that come off of the off the dock to talk to Sigma, and. Um, Says, Sigmund asks her straight up, like, I'll ask you this once, why do you help us? Who are you people? Mm. This is alluding to what you were saying. He knows he's not in charge. Yeah, yeah. And he's he's obviously concerned about this. Right. Like, I don't understand why you're helping us because Gebler started helping Ave, because uh, Kislev had the upper hand. Yes. And then Gebler started helping Ave, and then they got the upper hand. And now it seems they're giving aid to Kislev now, and they yeah, just keep balancing they're, they're, these powers. What do you call it? It's right? called war profiteering. Yes. That's what it's called. And they're just pitting everyone against each other to keep them from actually getting powerful enough to challenge them directly. Right. Yeah. So, who are you people? And she says, I've told you before, I simply wish to observe what is in store for the world. There are so many things you people must know. I'm merely your guide. I cannot directly assist you. How you use it is entirely up to you. So there's a couple things I get from this. Mm. First of all, forgot to mention, she mentioned specifically she's a representative of Graf, because he's like, where's Graf? Sigmund asks, where's Graf? Isn't he supposed to be the one that came? Mm. So he's in contact with Graf. Right. And Graf is offering this assistance to Kislev mm. now. Interesting. So, But instead they sent a representative. They sent this representative, this yeah. masked woman, who is like, I'm here in place, but you know, I represent him at this point. 
Um, but she's, but the, the other part of this is I get a little bit of Childhood's End vibes from this. We, we referenced this a little bit in the first episode. Childhood End, Childhood's End is a novel mm. um, by 2001 Space Odyssey, Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, um, who, everyone should read it. I don't want to spoil the book or anything mm, like that. Okay. Like everyone who has an interest in Xenogears and wants to understand all of its references, make time to read Childhood's End, it's really good. But the, the, the story basically is that a bunch of aliens come to Earth and for the longest time, they just kind of sit there and they don't reveal mm, themselves. Right. And they're just observing and people kind of get used to these aliens being there and yeah. being present and broadcasting or giving them messages but not showing themselves, right? right? And it's this very slow process of revealing themselves and sort of being guides. They, uh, we're here to guide you and mm -hmm. to assist you sure, and to observe sure. the course. next stage of humanity. Yeah. Um, so I get a little bit of that from this. But anyways, read Childhood's End. It's a fantastic book. <laughs> um, they're guiding the next step of human evolution. And that's as far as I'll go. But that's kind of like the basic premise of the book, right? Um, but he's like, so you want no recompense? Uh, Sigmund says to her, you're like, you're just giving this to me for free. You want nothing in return. I, what is it that you want, really? And this is when she basically says, oh, okay. Well, we want the pilot that you found and that gear that you found that we brought to you, we mm. want you to put them into D-Block. <laughs> and now, the way that this, this and he's, he finds yeah. this to be a, a very strange request. He's mm -hmm. like, why would you ask for that? But okay, you mm -hmm. know, I guess we'll do it. We can't just deny them at this point. Yeah, right? he tells one of his advisors, they're like, do we, like, why would we do this? And he says, well, we have no choice. He says, I, um, I owe them, or something yeah. like, we owe them yeah. something. Like, yeah. we owe them this favor. So, so that means they have done him favors and they kind of have a symbiotic relationship to right. some degree, where he clearly has not the upper hand. Definitely not. So Nortun, the, the city here, is broken up into four blocks, plus like a central district. So the central district is where like the palace would be, where like the yeah. government is run from, right? Mm -hmm. But then you have like A, B, C, and D block. Mm. And the A, B, and C blocks are where citizens live, you know, yeah, just businesses civilian and places. civilian places. D block, the whole block is dedicated as a prison. Mm. So it's where all the prisoners go and they just live in D block and they, they stay in D block. So there, this masked woman who represents Graf is, and we know Graf is trying to wean Faye into a role that he wants and he's trying to kill Mother God, right? He's trying to like bring him to that. You know, Saitan's trying to wean him whatever way he's trying to wean him. Mm -hmm. And we got this masked man who fought him in the tournament, mystery man who's, who brought him to his village three years earlier or whatever, right? Yes. He also is, you know, trying to like observe Faye. So the, all these people They're have plans there for to Faye. watch, yeah. Uh, and so Graf is behind this sending Faye to D-Block. He mm. wants something to happen to him. This is all part of a plan. So anyways, he sets it up. And then we open up uh, where, oh, first, before, before we get into D-Block, we have a really interesting scene that I wanna get your thoughts on. And, and uh, this is where things get abstract. And I remember in mm -hmm. one of the previous episodes you were saying, you know, I was interpreting this very literally there are a lot of things coming up where you're going to have to probably to stop trying yeah. to examine things literally. Yeah, that's always my first <laughs> go-to. I always have to kind of rethink for any yeah. um, extra. You'll yeah. definitely have to do that with this imagery because we'll see it many times throughout the game. But a scene plays out where you see Faye as a child playing with a woman. There's a ball. Yeah. And they're kind of passing it back and forth. Yes, yeah. And then that image kind of turns into There's a like projection. A Flash, yes, yes. Okay, I told you this. I didn't tell you this. I told somebody else this. So one of the things that happened in the 1930s, which is why this psychological, there was kind of an explosion that kind of more or less started with Freud, and um, it was before the 30s, but it really, there, you, it rose to a level of prominence in the 30s that was kind of crazy. Everybody was talking about this and the psychological theories of you know human behavior and all this yeah. stuff. Um, 
some of the reason why that exists, and specifically with Carl Jung, is the way that movies are. Jung tried to analyze like films specifically, saying what is it about a movie that's so captivating, that's so yeah. enthralling, and that he came up with a theory that's like the mirror kind of, you're, you're seeing a reflection of yourself in the characters. You, you, you go into, I think what Jung would call a dreamlike state. It puts you into a sort of, um, a second level of consciousness, right? Not, mm. not your super voluntary, but not your subconscious. It puts you right into that place where you're super susceptible, the suspension of disbelief is possible, uh, yeah. where you can, you're just like a dream, where you don't really question the dream when you're in it, you yeah. know? You're just like, oh, this is how it is, this is crazy, oh my gosh, what's going on? But then, when you're watching a movie, a movie has the power to hypnotize you, to put you into that more submissive state where you're suspending disbelief and you're willing to accept uh, the things happening to the protagonist of the film as if that protagonist was you and you were looking at yourself in a mirror. Yeah. So there's kind of, any, I think he calls it the mirror stage of child development, which is like one year old or something, whenever a kid looks in a mirror and recognizes that what they're seeing in the mirror is, is themselves. Their own reflection. Yeah. yeah. And th at that point, there's that stage of development. I think Jung calls it the mirror stage. but that that's what a movie kind of reverts us back to. It takes us back into that point. Quick note here, it was not Carl Jung, it was actually Jacques Lacan who came up with the mirror stage of development where a child uh, looks in the mirror and recognizes themselves as a separate individual uh, person. So Jacques Lacan, not Carl Jung as I stated. So I actually did think of this when okay. we watched this part because we're seeing Faye's memories and all of a sudden it's on a black and white film, just as if, you know, back in the 1910s or something. It's just a silent film that's just kind of playing. And, and he's sitting there watching himself, a movie of himself, about himself. That's a clear reference to Jung's kind of idea of film in general and the mirror stage. It's almost like a comforting, yes. almost maybe escapist pursuit. It, right? it, yeah, it feels that way. And, and you're, you're, you're just a... But but the, but the the Faye that's watching it is clearly more or less hypnotized by it. He's just kind mm -hmm. of watching and he's very excited about what he's seeing and kind of like this is how things are supposed to be kind of idea. Well, remember that uh, for the type nine on the Enneagram of Personality, their biggest fears are of loss or separation, yes, yes. fragmentation. Which Faye, as far as we know, doesn't have a mom. We've sort of seen his dad. Yeah. We haven't really seen his mom. I'm correct on that, right? Right, we've not seen his <laughs> Just mom. Just making sure. Not yet. So we don't know what's going on there, uh, but Faye clearly still has the longing for his father, his mother, his, yeah. the, the parents, right? That's still just ingrained as a part of him. But um, there is another part of him that says, the, the way things are supposed to be is me playing with my mom as a kid, and that is, that is a more like mid-level um, conscious kind of, Thing, I guess, where you kind right. of revert to your basic moral tendencies, just in general, about mm -hmm. how things should be and how things ought to He's be. You do that for it. movies as well. So it's a yeah. general, it's just, it's a very good, I like that presentation there, it's very good. Yeah, and so it's, the camera's kind of swinging around and, and adult Faye, mm -hmm. the guy that we've been playing as all the time, is watching a childhood version of him watching this film. Of himself. And then yes. it swings around the backside and, and there's another the version of that. other kid Faye yes. with the crazy hair over yes. the eyes says, you're not supposed to be here and shuts it down. So to the adult thing. Yes. Yeah. So, so um, I, I'm starting. So when I first saw these, I was like, these are memories of the past. Mm -hmm. This is kid. This is kid Faye remembering his childhood self because he doesn't remember his childhood. So right. I was like, oh, we're getting little glimpses here. Right. I, I am not thinking that anymore. Um, I'm thinking in, in different terms, I guess. I'm thinking of, um, I already mentioned the conscious, voluntary, the intermediate stage, and then the lower stage. Of I'm so of glad you made this connection because right? I wanted to talk about this so bad. Okay. Well, because I already mentioned last episode that there is the Freudian version of that, yes. which is your ego, your superego, and, and, the, and id. the id, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm seeing as soon as because it it, it it takes this though I'm on the I'm on the right track more or less yes <laughs> okay because it takes this it, it took me watching the kid watching his memories as though he was watching a film for me to make the connection that we're 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 into psychoanalytical territory here yes. this is not an actual 
-hmm. memory. And I, and I think it was well done by the our, our authors of the game yeah. um, in, in implementing that. But I'm starting to see that this kid, and this is why I brought up, this is the way things should be, his, his idea of morality, that is the superego, just generally speaking. It is the, this is life and it's positive and this is, how it, this is how it works. And then there's the darker part that lurks in the shadows that would be the id. I, I still don't quite understand the earlier scenes that we saw with these characters in them. Yes. I accept that they're not his younger self now. But I don't, I don't know how it all fits in. But I do see that that's what we're seeing here. The shadowy, dark, I mean, it just fits, right, with the Freudian stuff. Although he's using Jungian imagery to convey a Freudian idea. <laughs> he's, he kind of, he's kind and of working in two exactly. different philosophies Which into were one. kind of at odds with each other. Now, so like you and I would look at this, neither of us being PhDs in psychology, sure. right? You and I would probably look at this and be like, okay, we see how these can mesh and be similar enough, right? Yeah. But Jung and Freud hated each other because of this difference. They did not, they didn't see eye to eye on how the subconscious the granular self parts works. Of it. Yes. I think Instead actually, of the broader parts of yes, it. Yes, right? exactly. The granulars, and that's what a, a psychology PhD would likely yeah. be like. No, they're totally different. But it's like, to, to the average person who's relatively educated in a, like yeah. a sophomoric way, I suppose. Yeah. Like, the, these it's, can't, they're not incompatible, yeah. right? Completely incompatible. Yeah. There's differences, but they're more or less referencing the same ish kind of thing, yeah. right? And so the, the Jung's version of the id was just the, the deep subconscious that 90% of all your thought happens in, but it's all your instinctual stuff, right? It's, and then the superego is his like mid-level consciousness and then the high level is the ego. But Jung's version of the ego is actually the one that won out more or less over Freud because Jung's version is what pop culture typically refers to as the ego today, right? Oh, sure. to inflate my ego and all that. That's Jung. And whereas Freud said, no, your ego is just the, dis the selector between your id or your superego in any given situation. Right. And, and Jung said, no, your ego is ever present. It is a, a version of you more or less that is always there and has its own, it's just your higher level of consciousness, yeah. that your, your immediate what you're making decisions to do right now. Like I do this with my hands. That's Yeah, your ego yeah. is kind of in And then to deflate your ego is is it, it means something different than for Freud. Because it has, that saying doesn't make sense for Freud. Sure. But, you know, I, I at least wanted to point this out. I, I don't want to go into super depth just yet because there's a lot more secrets to be revealed. But we have three versions of fame mm. represented in the scene. Yeah. A the child version of it with the hair pulled back the adult version of him that we've known for the whole game, mm -hmm. and then this version of the, the shadowy kid version, who's been mocking him and who has kind of this evil yeah. sense or aura, and who's him. kind of always there, right? But that's the version that comes out when things go wrong. When things go wrong, right? Which which mm -hmm. is true though it, within like Freud's, you you resort to your instinctual self when you're in a crisis, right? Crisis. You do the basic human needs, that's what you yeah. do. It's like if your body goes into shock, it cuts, it cuts blood off from your arms and it focuses just on your vital organs, right? right. So your arms and legs, and I, I don't remember if it cuts blood off or from your head, actually. I, don't, I doubt it. Your, your brain it needs your brain Because you do kind blood. of pass out. Your brain does need blood, so maybe it doesn't quite <laughs> do that. But it mostly focuses on your vital organs, right? Sure. And that would be, this, your brain has a psychological way of doing the same thing where it's like, oh, things are crazy, shut off everything else and revert to just the yeah. inner most basic thing so that we can survive. Because right. otherwise we might not survive. So in, in Freud's version of this, it's like you said, the id, the ego, and the superego. Yes. In Jung's version of it, it's the ego, the personal unconscious, and then collective unconscious underneath that. Right, which is, so, yeah, the, yes. But yes. in the, either case, it, the, the mind is kind of divided into three. Three, yeah separate things, right? Yes. So, the fact that we have three separate versions of Fey, this is a very abstract sort of like environment that he's in, right? This is not meant to be taken literally, oh, there's three Fey's <laughs> and they're watching a little movie, like, right? This is a, yeah. an abstract representation of Fey's mind. Mm. What did that mm. for me is the fact that Fey's there and the shadowy Fey calls attention to that. And it's yeah. like, 
And this is clearly not a memory of anything that actually happened. In, like not even close. In Freud's sort of like take on this, the id, when you were just saying, coming yeah. to protect somebody, right? Like Yes, in moments of crisis, the id is what takes over. Walked up and said, you are yeah. not supposed to be here. Get out. When did this dream happen again? Well, this happens right before he wakes up in the Kislev D block. Okay, so this is in between. In between after he fought Vanderkam. Yes, so in between when things went weird. Yeah, because he was in the, some, remember he was in, he was in the cockpit and, and he's watching his guys go attack. Yes, and he starts kind of like Because he's, it, he's right? like, no, 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 I'll come with you. They're like, no, we're going to buy you time. They said, you go leave, find Bart. but he won't leave. And he's like, I don't want to leave. And then as they're fighting, he kind of reverts into a, yes. a state. So from that point until uh, Block D, this is where that dream takes place. In between that. Yeah, in between that. So we see nothing of fade between them. That is very interesting. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> I just need to think about that. I don't know, because I don't want to just Kay. like ramble about stuff I don't know about, because I don't know what happens later on in this game. But like, it's, it's interesting that that dream could essentially be what he, you know, what was happening while that dream was happening is, is yes. a nuclear bomb, right? Correct. But I, but I, I don't know. I, I guess I need some time to kind of think about that before. So what do you think? I just want to know. I'm curious. I don't know. Well, the id takes over and then it makes a bomb explode. <laughs> it kills everybody. Right. It just makes a bomb blow up. And so there's a part of him that just like, just um, is like, hey, let me drive. Let me take over. Yes. And then wants to just literally destroy everything in sight. Yes. And then I guess when things are okay, it takes a back seat, but it takes such a toll that Faye is unconscious. And then when Faye wakes up, he doesn't really remember. Remember it. what happened. Right. Now, I don't know why that happens. Psychologically speaking, I don't understand right. Right. why he wouldn't we, necessarily we haven't seen, remember. We haven't seen the event that yeah. caused the trauma. And they aren't showing it. Maybe there's a reason they're not showing us exactly what happens when, when the nuclear bomb goes off. As far as I can tell, it's a nuclear bomb. Um, well, we, I guess we kind of saw it in Mahan. We did. It's more. It's just a bomb. It's just it's an ace bomb. It's like a bunch of beams yes, shoot it shoots out everywhere, and, and then people, people and just get just vaporized. Explodes. But and I guess that's what's happening. But I just we haven't seen it, and I don't know how else to explain like what's happening other than Faye has like some crazy power. So Graf is talking about, hey, I will make the I will make the or, um, I will make your inner power bloom like a flower. He's saying that to Vandercom, right? Yeah. Like I will I will grab your inner potential and make it manifest, right? So somehow Faye has this incredible inner potential, this huge yeah. inner potential. Um, but in order to use it. He ha he can't use it like consciously. He has to subconsciously allow it to just kind of happen. He has no control over it. Right. right. But I, I still don't know exactly. Okay. What's going on? That's good I enough. don't understand why the Veltal doesn't break when that happens. Oh uh, yeah, it's kind of like um, in in Mir when um, mm. when uh, Emil like blows up everything, <laughs> but somehow he and the party survived. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and like Nier was like right there when like the thing exploded. He didn't get killed by it. Oh, Kinda really... didn't get killed by it. Yeah, we woke her up. Emil didn't get killed by it. Everyone else did. Everyone else did. <laughs> His magic, you know, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. So after that, <clears throat> we just keep all that stuff in mind, right? We wake up in D block, the prison. There's a doctor there sort of explaining the situation. And as she's doing that, a bunch one, of guys One come thought first, though. Okay. <laughs> that thing happens, and then Graf... Graf, Graf is, showed up. Graf shows up, and then immediately puts us back with Veltal again to get us to use it to start fighting again. Yes. So... So Graf set up I mean, I assumed that he wanted this explosion to happen over and over and over, right? But does he just want to like destroy the world? Like he could just do that himself. Right? He he's trying to There's awaken. A purpose. He's trying to awaken it, a power in fact. Yeah. Specifically, a very that destructive he can then use. break everything in the world power. Yes, and he's trying. He's going to use that to kill God. Oh right, for Mother God. Yes. Yeah. No. No, he doesn't. He like Mother God. Well, he well he said specifically in the scene to kill Mother God. To kill Mother you're right, God. You're right, you're right, you're right. But we'll just call that God for now. So, so he thinks this nuclear bomb can kill God. Yes. He's trying to kill God. He can't do it. Yes. He's not strong enough. Yes. But we are. But Faye is. 
Possibly. And he's trying to awaken the power in Fang. Okay. Cool. By making him fight. I mean, that makes sense. So he's like cultivating a weapon, yes. more or less. Yeah. At least for, as far as what we know at this point. I know, but I'm, I'm starting to wonder about Satan now. <laughs> <laughs> This is kind of, I'm kind of like having to backtrack on the whole game. Sometimes like talking out loud kind of helps to like put it together. Through. But when you're on a podcast, then it's like people are listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the powerful thing about it is you can cut out as much as you want. <laughs> That's true. Um, <laughs> I probably won't. We'll see. Okay. So he wakes up in D block. A, a doctor is explaining his situation, where he's at, what's going on, what D block is. And then some dudes come down and they're like, okay. We've held off long enough, it's time for his baptism. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering what this was gonna be, but it, <laughs> it was kind of what I figured. I was like, yeah. I hope it's not just like they beat us up. And it is. <laughs> it's basically so, what it is. And she's like, well, not in his condition, that's unthinkable. It's like, yeah. and then they kind of threaten her, and she's like, oh, I can't like defy these guys, I'm sorry. Yeah. And so he's Which like, is fine, weird. They're prisoners. I don't get how this prison's run. Well, it, it's like open, it's not a prison. There are some prisons. It's just like, oh, you have to live here now, and you can do whatever you want. So you should watch, a, a sh everyone should watch, actually. There's a series on Netflix called um, World's Most Dangerous Prisons. Mm -hmm. It's actually really interesting. So this guy yeah. goes to all these different prisons around the world oh, that's and like, see how they're run on the inside. That'd be kind of and fun. there are some prisons where it's like, they don't have the, the personnel to like really run these things the way they should. Oh, really? And prisoners inside have a lot of freedom. That's crazy. And they have <laughs> knives, they have weapons, they have uh, drugs, they have all kind. They have a whole ecosystem inside of that prison, and and like a rank, mm -hmm. you know. Is this and in like Brazil? Or? Yeah, South America, but also Africa and like other okay. places. So places um, where it's hard enough just to get things working in your local village, there, much less the prison there, where, where or everyone. Or even in hates. like the Philippines, there are some there are some prisons where these guys when they get out of prison, it, they consider yeah. it a vacation. And then they go back to prison again to go back yeah. to work because they make more money in prison oh, than no they way. can outside. Oh, that's crazy. They make more money for their families well, I know running gangs from inside of prison I than they can yeah. make outside. That's crazy. So, I know someone who's from the Philippines and he was explaining to me how he, for fun, he would kick uh, empty like milk jug kind of thing yeah. for soccer and then he would collect bottle caps and that was it that's all he had to play with yeah was like trash basically yeah. i was like dang dude yeah. and he's like a millionaire now by the way <laughs> he's he he came to america and he he has it good now but yeah philippines is is i uh, that makes sense that it would be they're, that hard they're super crowded to make they, money they, they're yeah. like they, they outnumber the prison guards like hundreds to one wow that's like, wild i mean these places are crazy they're really messed up so okay. d block after having seen that series, is like, yeah. like totally. I, I get it's it. not that. I, bad. I get it. It's, but it's not weird that, weird. that there's like doctors and nurses that are there, but they're being yeah. threatened by the staff. But they volunteer. Is my guess they volunteer to work here, or are they assigned there? I guess. Okay. They sure. need and medical they staff. And they need guards. I mean, there are guards at the exits of. Yes. Like the. It's a very screens, locked down right? place. Yeah. So they can't leave D block, but within D block. They're pretty free, yeah, and, and like they have their own ecosystem, which is what yeah. Rico, the character you go to meet, who's like the boss yeah. here, he sort of introduces to. It's like, okay, this is the way things are run here. We have to determine your rank right yeah. away. We have to see where you're going to fit into the and we're like exhausted the hierarchy like, yeah. of this prison, right. right? And and right, we just woke up from very traumatic battle from a nuclear bomb <laughs> that we somehow survived again. Um, yeah. And he's gonna make you fight a bunch of guys and how, determining on how far you get in that fight, you'll get your rank. So if you lose, you're D. Mm -hmm. If you win one, C. If you win two, B. If you win three or four, A. I can't remember. Anyways, yeah. it's, a, it's a ranking system. I don't think you can win more than four. Yeah, you can't beat Rico. Okay, it's a scripted I, I, I battle. I think so. Um, but it's so funny that we beat up four people and then we're like, I don't want to fight, no. <laughs> I, fighting's bad, you guys. Don't make me fight. He's like, it's like, this we is just so beat everyone else up. But, so it's kind of funny that... They kind of... We didn't don't say that for anyone else. They kind of don't give you a choice, but... Yeah, yeah. But then all of a sudden for Rico, it's like, oh, now, now we're done fighting. And you could say that we just got exhausted, but that's not the reason that Faye gives. Faye is like, I hate fighting. I don't want to fight. Don't make me fight, right? But he didn't say that at first. He waits until yeah, he beats up four you know, people. Why, why, wouldn't, why wouldn't you just start off by saying, whatever your lowest <coughs> rank is, 
Just give it I to guess me. that's what <laughs> I am. Yeah, someone punch me in the face and just give me a wall strike. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> you got to give the player something to do, I guess. Oh, but. yeah. No, it was fun. It was fun. <laughs> it's just his reasoning could have been more, oh, I'm so tired instead of... But I think they're trying to work the moral into the story yeah. of he really doesn't want to fight, but the game's all about fighting and... Yeah. You gotta fight. <clears throat> so, I don't know, I you know, you battle up to whatever rank you get, um, and then Rico will essentially finish you off. You, yeah. you can't win that fight. <clears throat> um, so Rico is kind of like top ranking guy here, but he's also, you'll learn later, like the reigning champion of this battling arena that they have. Yes, yeah. Uh, in Kislev. And um, <clears throat> so... Anyways, before we get to that, he beats you up. You wake up again, <laughs> and the doctor's kind of explaining all of this to you. And uh, so you kind of go out into the town, and uh, you go into like the tavern or bar that they have. Yeah, yeah. And this is where you meet Hammer. But he looks like he looks like Splinter to me. He, he does. Like he looks like Master Splinter. Yeah. So I think he's a rat. Okay. Oops, I didn't even close that. Um, you can like, he's like an item shop too. He acts as that. Yeah, he's like a merchant, so kind of an underground black market merchant guy. Yeah. Right? He, he obviously kind of sleazy. He's like not, yes. being, not being totally truthful all the time. Yeah, yeah. But I, I like his way of talking. He's like, hey, bro. Like, hey, bro. I looked up the word he uses in Japanese, and it's like a, it's like a hard slang. It's technically respectful because it, it's referring to older people. Sure. So one thing to understand about his use of bro is that he, it's, um, it's not respectful speech. It's it's kind of rude speech in Japanese, but it does denote someone higher than you. It, yeah. You're referring to an elder or an older brother or something like that. Older brother. So it's not like he's pounding around like you're a kid. It's like you're rank A. Oh, bro, right, you're right. awesome, man. I'm just gonna call you bro as if. But it doesn't work so well in English. I don't think. Like it works okay, I suppose. But the 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 connotation for bro is like we're on the same level kind of thing. Sure. But in Japanese, it's more like no, you're above me. Yeah. But he still speaks super rude. But, sure. But he will, and it's not, I don't know, most people probably wouldn't love being um, addressed by, you know, in that manner. But it's technically denoting somebody who's... Well, and, who's, and, and uh, who's Faye does you. try to tell him, stop calling me. He that. does, and he's like, what do you want me to call you then? Or, you want to call me sir or Sir, something? yeah, yeah. He's like, okay, fine, whatever, just call me whatever you want. Right, I he's don't like, care. bro's mine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I guess we haven't mentioned he has, they all have these collars on. These prisoners. Yes, that's right. If you leave the the zone, if any of you guys have seen Battle Royale, it's similar to that. You got the necklace, you leave the area, and it blows up. It decapitates you. Yeah, it kill you. So you got to stay within the limits, otherwise you're dead. Yeah. That's why none of these prisoners can escape, right? It's, they're not, they don't keep them locked up necessarily, but they do have these collars mm -hmm. on. Uh, the first thing I thought of was... You can find a way to lure an important person in and grab them and start walking out. Ah, Someone's going to have to take that freaking bomb collar off of you or else right. you're threatening to kill them. But Interesting. Whatever. I, didn't think I don't that. know if anyone's tried that in the world of I just of thought years. of Battle Royale, which, by the way, we looked it up. Battle Royale came out like a year after this game. So yeah. the of idea course, was not. Maybe um, maybe important people know just to stay away from people. Like, oh, I'll bet. But what if it was the prison warden here? Yeah. Maybe they would just sacrifice that person. Okay, <laughs> new, new prison warden. Um, in any case, uh, you talk to Hammer there, but then you try to leave D Block, and uh, there will be a guard who, who stops you and says, Hey, there's mm -hmm. people who want to talk to you from the battling committee. You need to go back yeah. there and talk to them. There's like a woman that shows up. Yeah. She's like super Cohen. powerful. Cohen, Everyone I think her name is. respects yeah. her, yeah. Mm -hmm. Except her, is, guard, her guard bodyguards are like the dumbest people. <laughs> This is so a, funny. Yeah, they are really good. This is apparently a very rare opportunity, and this gave me a lot of FF7 vibes in terms of um, the, the prison underneath Gold Saucer, where it's like mm. they try to really stress, oh, man, <coughs> once you get in here, you <coughs> never get out. You never get You're out. You're here forever. <coughs> yep. Next thing you know, you're out. <laughs> I know. <laughs> because and like, you want a chocobo knows. race. <laughs> 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 it's like the only way out is to win a chocobo race. It's like... Why? Like, why? <laughs> Their society respects chocobo racers above all. <laughs> so it's like you could be a murderer. You could be, I don't know, like the worst person on earth. But if you entertain us by winning a chocobo race, you are pardoned and you yeah. get to go free again. I just don't see that as being any kind of... Um, it's not possible. Uh, <laughs> sustainable yeah. structure of prisons yeah. anywhere. However, 
if anybody out there does know of like maybe even a, like an ancient civilization or something. Yeah, I couldn't think of any. Where this was yeah. something that happened where you could escape your prison sentence or maybe your death yeah. sentence if you like won in some competition and they just respected you and it was like, oh, the gods favored you. So right. therefore, I guess they kind of have like, something like this in Game of Thrones. They, they, they oh, evoke yeah. like a, um, I forget what they call it, but it's like you challenge someone and it's like you can fight them for your life. And if you win, it's like, oh, the gods favored you and then you get to go. It's like mm. part of their law. But you have to fight a knight <clears throat> chosen by the person who's been offended or hurt by your criminal act. So they mm. could choose like, you know, like the, the greatest knight in the kingdom or something to fight you. So your chances of winning are not high, but like mm. if you can win, it's like, oh, the gods obviously want you to go free. But still, where did... Was there in that fantasy where did something that come from? like that in real life? Because it just seems no. to me like this has come up now in FF7 and in this game, where if you win some tournament or if you win a chocobo race, yeah. you're pardoned and you can get out of prison like a few mm -hmm. days after you get in there. I, I could think of ancient Roman uh, gladiators. That's like the closest thing that I can think yeah, of. Yeah, they, they made prisoners fight. They were slaves, right? Always prisoners. But yeah, there were slaves. I don't know if they ever could become free if they won enough things. I think typically they, there was the allure that they could become free if they kept winning, but then they just kept fighting harder and harder things until they eventually they they fought just, a lion and then they died they or died, whatever. Yeah. Right. Um, but maybe some of them actually became free after fighting. Like, isn't that um, Marcus Aurelius? Did, did did he get free through Gladiator, or did he did he die? <laughs> or did he become free through some other way? I actually can't remember. Yeah, I don't know. How that goes. But that's like the the only, the closest thing I can think of to that. But this so is maybe the Roman lot. Gladiator. Like, maybe. Was, is something, a but real it, life parallel where this could have been true. Maybe. <laughs> Although, I don't, I think Gladiators were, they, I mean, they may have been slaves, but they were often billed as gladiators. Not like, hey, this guy's on, here's here for first degree murder. <laughs> and everyone cheers watching him fight a lion, right? I don't yeah. know. I guess they cheer for the lion. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> but you don't want that person going free if people know they're a criminal. Uh, but just, if it's a slave, it's like, okay, he can be free. Yeah, it, it just feels like a funny trope that is yeah. a very convenient way to get players out of prison. And remember, mm -hmm. we talked about this in FF8. There's almost no prison escape sequence in an RPG that hard. feels like convincing to yeah, me. Yeah, because real prison escapes take years of planning and just low likelihood. It's, it's just like a series of very yeah. convenient things happen so that you get to you be get out lucky. of prison now. Yeah. And yeah, the, it, it always lucky. just ends up making the whole prison sequence feel flat because it th yeah. doesn't feel like there's any real stakes in it. I don't ever feel yeah. like, oh crap, I'm trapped here forever. Because I know I like can just, in, uh, I'm going to win a chocobo race and get out or yeah. something like that. Or in Ocarina of Time, they just keep putting you in the same cell with the open window. <laughs> and you, you just keep you just getting out. out. <laughs> you just keep using your hookshot. They don't take any of your weapons. They don't take anything nope, from you. No, no, no. Okay, hookshot, I'm out of here. It's hey, like, oh, no. how'd you oh, get out? Go back oh, okay. in there. <laughs> just get back out again. <laughs> how'd you get out again? Uh, yeah, it's yeah, just, they like always a, feel silly. Yeah. So, anyways, it's that's kind of my feelings on this. But if anybody knows of... Mm -hmm. A real life situation where this happened. The city is kind of cool, D Block, though. It's got some music that kind of plays like yeah. uh, Final Fantasy VII. It get, feels very much like the slums. Get used to that music. Yeah, nice. You will hear it a lot more for the rest of this game. I mean, I don't <laughs> mind it. It's, it's pretty cool. It reminds uh, me of that. You don't mind it yet. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see how you feel All about right. it after like 20 hours of the same music. <laughs> but it's, it's a good song. I like it too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the Imperial Battling Committee leader, Cohen, comes in, tries to ask Faye, will you participate in this battle arena? And he's like, no, I don't want to. I don't care about gears. First, I don't care about yeah. fighting. You're asking too much of me. I'm, and they're like, well, if you reconsider, like, come talk to me or whatever. And Hammer comes in like, bro, what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, dude. And we're like, This is, is your chance to get out. Like, right. you don't understand. There's no getting out of here unless you win this thing. You yeah. gotta accept, bro. You gotta accept. <laughs> And uh, he ends up bringing you back to kind of that room where you started and it says there's a new dock in the in D block. They moved that other girl out. And there's a new dock coming in. Yeah. And it's Saitan. Yes, I was thinking up. it might have been the the pirate, the um, Yggdrasil doctor. Oh. I was like, oh, that'd be fun if we got, we got to see her again. Yggdrasil. And it was Satan, and I was like, yeah, I guess that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. And the first thing 
Doc comes in, he's like, being like, "You're joining the tournament, so right?" Oh, yeah. you're <laughs> again pushing him forward with the fighting and the battling and the gear and the escape. Yeah. Now he kind of plays this off as like, "Oh, you haven't forgotten your promise already, have you?" Yes, that was a little heavy-handed. I you, think you don't yeah. intend to stay in Didn't here. Didn't you tell Bart you'd help him? Yeah. Oh, you're not a liar, are you? <laughs> yeah. You wouldn't. You wouldn't. <laughs> Trying to make Bart, him. You, Bart. Like, Bart got captured. Him. <laughs> yes. So bad. So bad. Gaslighting him so hard. Yeah. You don't want to be considered a bad person, mm. do you? Well, well, of course not. And he gets right to the heart of Faye because that just immediately Faye kind of like is introspective and like, well, I did promise. I guess I have to. Well, yeah. You got me. You got me. Well, and I do kind of like his eventual response in the end of, of all of this talking with Saitan. Yeah. Where he says, I know, Doc. I still don't like gears. That much hasn't changed. When I pilot them, I become aware of how unstable my very being is. Mm. That even, was a good, I like that. Yeah. Even if I don't want to think of it, but at the same time, it's also a connection with a lost part of me. Yes. Well, he says it might be because you don't want to think of it. <laughs> yeah. Like he, his, his conscious shuts off. Right. If that's the case, then recently I decided I would stick with it to the end. Ellie also had been troubled by the same thing. Mm -hmm. And if I just stay depressed about it, nothing will improve. So... Faye is done rejecting the call at this point, and he's yeah. sort of reticent, but he's like, okay, I'm just going to do it. There's mm -hmm. things about myself I need to know. I yeah. care about Ellie, and she's going through some of that stuff. Yeah. I want to help people, and this is a power that can help me do that. So even though I hate it, I'm going to do it anyways, because what good can I do sitting around here feeling sorry for myself? Mm -hmm. So let's press forward. So I like that a lot. I like that he sort of reached that point. It's a good point in the story to be like, he's gotten to there. I'm going to do what it takes. Even if that so. means piloting a gear that I'm very afraid of and that I hate. Right. Right. So he's going to go join the, um, the battling arena and yep. doing what he can. Now, in the meantime, Saitan uh, uh, sort of offers to try to remove his bomb collar. Haha, <laughs> yes. I had him try. I had him try it. And it yeah. was... Uh, it was funny. So funny. there's there's two results that can come of this. And there's like a low percentage chance of one of them. The more common mm. one is that he'll try and then Faye will have some kind of premonition. You don't know this, but it's like yeah. it, it flashes as if, oh, he made a mistake. It flashes. And he blows, yeah, and it, you it, think that it everyone dies. It plays dies. some sad music like it's a game yeah, over. Yeah. But then it kind of comes back. And it's like, oh, okay, never mind. Well, it's because uh, we screamed or something, and yeah. Satan's like, whoa, you just suddenly started screaming. And we're like, yeah, something's weird. I don't feel... I don't feel comfortable with this Comfortable, anymore. yeah. And let's Satan's not do like, it. Yeah, let's not do it. So that's that's the much higher percentage event yeah. to happen. That's what happened to me, yeah. It's never happened to me before. Yeah. I remember the first time I played it, I had to do this many, many times reloading the save point mm -hmm. to get the other thing to happen. Oh, yeah. This time it happened on the first no try, way, and I nice. was like, no way, sweet, Sick. I don't have to sit here and record forever. Um, if, if the other option is mm. that Saiten will successfully remove the safety device from the bomb collar and be yes. like, oh, Whoops. well. <laughs> it's like pulling the <laughs> pin from a grenade. <laughs> it's like, well, if you rattle that thing too much, yeah. you're, um, it'll actually explode now. Wow. And he's like, well, crap, I'm going to be, like, battling in the gears and stuff, right? And yeah. he's like, well, the, the, the gears, I think he says something about, like, they absorb impact to such a degree oh, to where sure. hopefully it won't be, like, too much of a problem for you. <laughs> and you should be okay. <laughs> and then you, oh can, you can sell that safety piece to Hammer for, like, 4,000 gold or something okay, like so that. Okay, so there's some You can make a little money it. from it. Kind of a funny little thing that you, you can see if you reload that over and over and just try to that's get the other funny. thing to happen. A lot of people might not have seen that or might not know that's there. But then you're like, okay, you, you, you head out to C Block, which is where the battling arena is at, yeah. and they're going to let you fight. Now, the last scene here uh, that we're going to be looking at today is with the Gazelle, or as you call them, the Gazelle, the gazelle yeah. Ministry. Um, I have all the dialogue here. We're going to go through it line by line. A lot of this, you are not meant to know what they're talking about. Yeah, I'm expecting It's very vague. It's 
referencing terminology we haven't seen yet. It, they're talking about stuff that we, we don't know at this point. Mm. But there is some other key stuff that does, I think, elucidate some things, and I just want to see what's being picked up. Okay. So, imagery-wise, it's like kind of a sphere, like a mechan like a like a computer. Yeah, it's like some, a ball computer. Yeah. With uh, some monitors on it. Yeah, and, and like some, some floating spheres going around things it. Things going around it, yeah. And it just projects these images of these red and blue. Mm -hmm. Almost, they look almost like Krang from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. You know, the the brain. Mm -hmm. he, he's like the main bad guy of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the really? cartoon. I actually don't oh, recall though. that. I don't you don't know Shredder. Krang. I remember Krang, dude. From I don't remember Krang. I don't think I do. Yes, you do. You have Maybe to. Maybe I do. You have to, dude. He's the little brain that sits inside of the. Oh, I've seen that. I've seen that. He sits inside of this oh body. Oh gosh. Okay, yeah. And like, he, and he's like a brain, right? And so like, yes. he, he's like running this like machine thing oh my gosh. from inside of here. Dude, that I haven't seen an image <laughs> like that in probably close to 25 years. <laughs> so Krang. That's crazy. Krang, these guys kind of look like Krang to me oh. a little bit. But I like these little brain dudes in these, uh, in these like black robes that kind of cover their faces a little bit. Oh, um, anyways. They are discussing some things, and we're just going to kind of go one by one. Okay. So you have uh, Gazelle Blue number one, faster than we expected. In answer to that, the red one, the awakening of the untouchable one. Right. So, I mean, I guess that's Faye. Faye. Okay. We're, we're untouchable. Right. Next guy. Uh, it's been three years since we heard any news. According to the memory cube, he, in quotations, is currently in Nortune, the imperial capital of Kislev. Is that... Why... So why are they putting he in quotes all the all the time? Like, I, I get it. He is whatever. But it's always in quotes. It's always in quotes. And that is like... Um, I think it's so It's that a separate, like, pronoun. It's like a... It's a they're separating this pronoun from the normal pronoun. But it seems like arbitrary. <laughs> it seems really arbitrary. I think it would seem arbitrary if like you were to put the kind of emphasis on it that it seems to be suggesting by putting the quotes on in the first place. Like italicizing. That's what yeah. I, but I guess you can't do that on a video game. But I, I think also just because the game is so complex that in the writing of it, it's a way of making sure we we are always aware of the he that's being spoken about. Oh, because so they always refer to he with the quotes. Sure. So yeah. Saitan Fair enough. Fair enough. says, if Fair he enough. awakens here in yes. Mahan, yeah. he all, then says that again at the border of Kislev when he sees the machine that Vandercom was in. He's like, oh, this is, what does he say? Something about, um, this is just like, I just read it. Yeah, but um, when he, when he this is like the last time he or something when he destroyed the, gears or something like that. I can't remember. Um, I guess I didn't write it down. Yeah, but, but like, yeah, I get it. I and I, I guess that does kind of make sure that he, they're referring to him, like you know that. And uh, who else? There, uh, I think Graf refers to he, he like sure. anytime they're referring to he, it's this person that they're a f they're worried about. Right. I mean, it's Faye. And it's Faye. <laughs> yeah. But but even... It it just feels... <sighs> it feels weird. It just feels weird. It Saitan feels, says it, feels it feels weird. to Dan, kind of more to himself than to Dan in, in Lahan, though, but he's like, yeah. if, if he, he awakens, awakens here, here yes. like it would be a disaster. Yes. So... It's, it's as though they're referring to a different person. But it's Faye. <laughs> yes. Okay. But but he Just also talked about somebody being. Remember in okay uh, the beginning of the game when he's like, Where there's he's somebody like there's someone inside, inside of you. you. So it's like a separate. So like so like Faye. So like so like when the id takes over Faye, there's a separate person in Faye that's like manifest. If he awakens. Yes. And that's and and so that's what's happening there because that's what they keep referring to. Yes. It's like this. So when you're talking about there's a there's a person inside of him. That's the that's person. That's the he. That's they're the person about. they're referring to. So it's not just Faye. Well, it's it, like it kind of is. Well, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. Well, I don't know. It's <laughs> okay. fine. Okay. It's we'll fine. just leave it just, at that. We'll just leave it at that just for keep now. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> K. 
Okay, so he is currently in Nortun, the imperial capital of Kislev. Uh, detestable, vexing, cursed. They don't like he, whoever it is. If only he did not exist, the lambs would not have been turned into the animus. We talked about Anima and Animus with mm, Carl Jung stuff. We did. We'll learn more about what this means later. Okay. Cool. It has been 500 years since our fall in the days of destruction that he caused. We would not have to do this in oh. such a troublesome manner as we do now. Okay, I want to see the connection you make before I comment on it. <laughs> We've established <laughs> that he, he's not 500 years old, but he has these memories, so... So but, it, but we talk about the collective unconscious. It could be that he's absorbed like the spirit of some somebody else. But that's like he hidden. apparently painted Sophia. Yes, five hundred years ago. But I'm I'm thinking that just wasn't him. He he's seeing that memory, but it wasn't him. Okay. Right. But but he's absorbed the memories um, somehow. Okay. Through the collective subconscious. Yeah, How the about collective that? unconscious. I'm, I'm doing my best. Okay, <laughs> I don't know exactly. Okay. Like, like I don't get the technicalities, I'm, I'm, but I do understand that there's some part of him that is older than he. I'm is. just I putting don't get emphasis on things to think about. Okay. Gazelle blue number two. The evac uh, uh, excavation. The excavation of the animal relics in each area is proceeding as planned. I have a thought about this because we talk about the animus is the lambs, the anima are the relics, meaning yes. the gears, right? And so the animus being the people and the anima being the gears are two halves that are meant to come together. Does that sound You're like pretty right good? Path. You're okay. on the right path. I, when they use those words in light of our conversation yeah. last week, that's yes. where I'm kind of connecting that. He says, it's too late to change things now, but in the future we'll shape what will be. The guy says, "Detestable, so vexing, they're, cursed." They're not again. happy about this. No, they're pissed. They don't. They don't want this to happen. So they don't want this to happen, right? Well, we did kind of establish more or less with um, what's his name, the dude, the um, Graf, that he's kind of working against the wills of the power that be, right? Because mm -hmm. he's going, he wants to kill God, and he's kind of going against like the grain, so yes. to speak. The, remember, we keep referencing the fact that all the villains seem to be against each other. Yes. They yes, all have yes. opposing motivations and they're all after their own right. thing. And so they're all villains, but they all want different stuff. These gazelles seem to me more like the Illuminati types, though. Like they're in yeah. control, but oh no, something happened. Ah, dang it, that wasn't supposed to happen. And yeah. it's, it's more or less what graphics They got doing. some, some uh, wild cards and loose ends. Yes, yeah. And it's like fake. Getting in the way of their plan. Graph. All these people who are like doing things that they're not supposed to do, mm -hmm. like how do we deal with this? Yeah. Okay, although we do not know which route it flowed from, we're fortunate the gatekeeper was activated. You're not supposed to have any idea what that is. No. And then the guy says, uh, from the ethos? Or it doesn't matter, although. So are you saying we mustn't break ignis equilibrium? So equilibrium being the Equal right, the there's powers some balance. Of Ave and Kislev. Sure. We don't oh, Ignis, the, the continent. Ignis is the continent. There you go. So, yeah. do, yeah. are you saying we, sh we shouldn't break that equilibrium between Kislev and Ave? Well, it is the surface, and the land is unclean. That is merely an excuse. So it's a justifiable it. reason. Even Cain would not object. Yeah, and they've mentioned Abel uh, sometime. I think Ellie mentioned Abel earlier on in the game. So, we have like. Cain and Abel now. Abel, I don't know if the names are like important. To Abel the is referencing the people who are not lambs. Yes, so that's kind of all the name. Solarians are Abel. Yeah. All of the people on the surface are lambs. Are lambs, but then there's Cain. Now they're talking about that's, Cain. Okay. Right. Cain and Abel. I you, would assume it's an opposition to Abel, but they just use names sometimes. You'll get this more later. All right. But we can't use the Geisha key yet. Not until the proper time comes. We'll talk about the Geisha key a lot more in the future. There's a whole lot to get into with that. It's a reference to something else, too. Uh, there's a third fleet in Bledovic. Their reserve units will do. Oh, his fleet. Your orders? To purge. Give no motives. If he knew our motives, it's obvious he'd do something unpredictable. But wouldn't we need more men to raise the entire area of Nortun? There's an ancient reactor in Nortun. We'll uh, use that. The half-life fall half fallout will kill... Uh, sorry. The half-life fallout will be 10,000 years. Nothing will be able to live within 300 Celts of the explosion. However, 
They've lived through that before. They won't perish that easily. But we must at least eliminate him. So they, they don't like us. They don't want Faye to, they, they want Faye out of the equation. Okay. They don't want Faye around. I mean, I more or less got that. But. Uh, yes, there's nothing we need from there, so be it. Take care of it. If it is a direct hit, well then, your orders are given. So. Cool. Things to think about, but they definitely don't like Faye. So they might kind of mess with Kislev here soon. <coughs> yeah. They, they want to torch the place. <laughs> if we have a bomb strapped to our neck, could they could easily kill us, don't you think? I, I suppose if they were to have somebody, I don't know. I don't know I if mean, they're like it would be a big intervention, and they, but they could. I don't know if, the, if, the, if, if they have somebody at headquarters in Kislev who could like just, I want bomb number 67 on that yeah. particular blow up now. I don't or know if it works like that. Blow up all the bombs, they wouldn't or care. Or if it's just set up to explode only if they leave a certain area. I don't know how that works. Yeah, but yeah, that's there's true. a point to be made. Uh, depending on the influence that the gazelle They seem very has, powerful. They should be capable of just literally just reaching down and plucking. I mean, apparently they kidnap people all the time, right? Yeah. They could kidnap Faye. Kidnap Faye. And, um, well, how easy would that be, though, if you have all these other powerful people opposing you? So Who Graf is ke- That's true. Ke- keeping a very close eye on this. He is. I'm sure Graf will try to oppose yes. the Gazel Ministry. I yeah, that's that's for sure. Satan might yeah um, intervene. Um, whoever the fetch is in the red gear might. <laughs> it's just a bunch of wild cards that yeah. you're right. It may not be that easy, but they are seeming to me to be quite power, quite the powerful group of people. They're that are literally orchestrating everything. That's but happening. it was kind of like you were saying, the Illuminati, if it was real, right? These people would be yeah. so powerful that there wouldn't be a united cause. They'd get in each other's way. Each of them would want things. to be because so th- it's like yeah. It, I'm really powerful. I could just do this if I didn't have that guy in my way, who's yeah. also as powerful. And they're me. all just yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's gonna okay. So I have to think about how to sidestep that problem. Yeah. And well, it's powerful people trying to cooperate with each other, and um, powerful people don't often cooperate well with right. each other. <laughs> exactly right. <sighs> That's the end of this podcast. That was actually really cool. <laughs> but I have stuff. I got a lot of stuff to chew There's on. a lot of stuff to think about and a lot of stuff to be revealed. And I'm just itching for when it happens so that we can just be like, okay, now that we know, we can go back and like point at this and this and this and see this and this was the setup I for this. I feel like <laughs> I have it figured out, but it sounds like I don't. <laughs> so We will find out soon enough. And All by right. soon enough, I mean in 10 more episodes. But <laughs> thanks for watching. Uh, We'll be back again next week with the next podcast. Until then, peace out, everybody. Look forward to your comments. See you next time.